or for this month's um, issues of Tool TV, what I would like to do is I would like to feature a project and I would like to work through this in four or five segments depending on how many weeks are in our month and um, we'll just work through it together. But what I'm hoping is that the techniques that you learn in this will be something that even if you don't paint along that you can apply to other areas of your painting. So today or this month we're going to feature the Twal Rooster Clock. Okay, and what this is, is this is Twal wallpaper right here. And so um, we're going to, Twal is spelled T-O-I-L-E, and it's pronounced like wall, but Twal. Okay, and it's a French word, and it's this tone-on-tone -tone, um, print. It comes in blues and greens and reds and pinks and yellows. It, it's like forever. There's a million patterns of Twal. And so, um, what I have done is I've taken just a regular wood clock, okay, or a regular piece of wood in the round, and I've applied the twelve wallpaper to it, and then we've um, painted on, I've made it black and then painted the rooster on top of the black surface. So we'll work through all these steps together. Just, um, it's a really unique, unique um, technique. For those of you painting memory boxes, you could easily get some baby pink um, or blue and apply it to the outside of the memory box. You know, don't be limited by the fact that this is a clock. It could be on a box. It could be any flat surface that you could apply wallpaper to would be perfect for this. Okay, I have my wallpaper here that I got from, hmm, it doesn't say, it says Hunter and Company. But what I did is I looked online and I, um, I looked online and found a, a website that does like um, supposedly discount wallpapers. But I have to tell you, I think that by the time I got, this is considered a double roll of wallpaper. By the time I purchased my double roll of wallpaper, good gravy, let's just rip right into that. Um, I think I paid almost $80 for this. So it is not a cheap thing, but what I've done is I've gone ahead and ordered you know, a fresh roll, and then what we're going to do, um, we will have it available online for those that are wanting to do this but not wanting to pay $80 for a single roll of wallpaper. Um, and we'll just divide the cost up uh, by how many of these things that we can get out of a tube of wallpaper. <clears throat> so, um, what I'm going to do is open it up, cut off a chunk. Okay, um, you want to cut it. Okay, so my, my clock is that big, so I'm going to want to cut something that's square. You know, I'm not going to cut it less width wise, but I am going to cut a length um, that will make sure that it will cover. So it doesn't matter if that it's square. Don't cut it round. Please don't cut it round yet. Um, so go ahead and cut your square. I'm going to just slide that to the edge. I'm going to make sure that I have enough. Um, when we sell this, it's going to be sold in squares. So. Okay, so what I have, I have a clock that is um, made out of just like a masonite kind of board or a, a particle board or whatever. can't decide if I'm cold or if I'm warm. Yikes, sorry. Okay, and I have my little cheesy foamy roller. This is a perfect use for this type of roller because what's going to happen is I'm going to get glue and all kinds of stuff into the roller, so I want something cheap, and this is just a couple bucks. Though when I put the twall paper onto my clock, I had no problem. I had no problem at all. But when I put them on the 25 pieces that I was prepping for convention the day before they were due at convention, um, nobody ever says that I don't run by deadlines. So, um, but what I did was I wet the, wet the glue on the wallpaper, I put it onto my surface, and about an hour later when I checked on them, they had all curled up. And by this time, they all were, had been cut. So I had glued them and cut them, and then they all curled up. And it, it was so difficult to realign and re-glue on after it was already cut. So we always leave that cutting A to the very last. But we needed a better way of applying. I would have thought that the paste, which is always impossible to get off of your wall when you have old wallpaper, um, would have stuck. But it didn't. So we learned, and we have a new way. So what we have is we have just our roller, and we're going to get it into water. We're going to wet it and squeeze it, and then you're going to squeeze out all the water that you can. Which means what I do for that is I just put it in a paper towel and I step on it so that it squishes all the water out. Yerk. Because there's a lot more foot pounds of pressure with me 
not being so lightweight. Okay. What you're going to do is you're going to put your palette paper. I'm going to get out so that I've got Aileen's tacky glue. You can use any white crafting glue. Let's see if I've got any wet glue in here. Glue can kind of tend to dry after a little bit. Okay, so we're going to go into here. It's going to make it go on a little bit smoother having a little bit of water in our sponge. We go into here and we're going to roll into our glue. Okay. Put a little bit more water. Okay. Now what we're going to do is go onto our, our piece. Moving quickly, I'm going to need more glue. So that was probably like four tablespoons of glue. <coughs> Oops, making noises. You don't want to wait too long with tacky glue because um, the idea is, is that it's tacky and you don't want it to dry. Now you could also use any kind of wallpaper that you want. This does not have to be tall wallpaper. It can be whatever you desire. So there are some really unique stone type faux wallpapers out there on the market. There are um, I need more, so we're going up to like, what, eight tablespoons? Probably could put out like a half a cup of glue, although. Now, there are a couple sizes of clocks available on the website. Whoops, making more noises. Okay, this is me trying to get the glue out of the container. I'll leave it upside down this time, so in case I need more, I don't have to make that noise. Okay. Anyway, there are a couple sizes of clocks available. Mine is a little bit large. Some people are afraid of big clocks. I happen to think that they're just wonderful. You don't want it to leak over the edge, but you definitely want it on the edge. Okay, almost there. Make sure everything is nice and wet. Get a little sticky over there. Okay, it's all in getting it covered, right? Okay, and I did not have any um, sealing on my wood surface. I'm not sure if I said that. Okay, now I'm going to get that adjusted. I like it. You can play around with it. You can shove it over because the pattern repeats, but it does weird things. All right, so now what you're going to do, get it nice and rubbed down everywhere, and then you're going to weight it down. And you are going to... Um, after you weight it down, you will let it dry, and uh, you'll let it dry overnight. Okay. And we'll pretend like I'm going to put my um, my roller in water and see if I can't get that glue out. I don't know if it'll come out or not. We're going to pretend like this is already dry. Okay. One thing, uh, let's talk about this. I do this every time. I am a knucklehead. These are the the slats on the back of the clocks that you're going to hang your clock with. Okay. So this needs to be straight. It doesn't have to be straight, but it should be straight. So, I am going to peel while I'm wet. Okay, so isn't it nice and refreshing to know that you're not the only one that ever makes a mistake? Now, what you can do to prevent this is you go with your clock, you look on the back, you find which way the slats are, and you mark top with a little marker that you know which way is up. Okay, now I've got to squish out my roller again and repeat that step. Oh yeah, I got a lot, a lot of gump in there. Okay, let me get that underfoot here. Okay, I'm going to flatten that nicely. Gonna need some more glue, aren't we? <laughs> Yikes. Okay, there we go. Keeping your glue bottle upside down is an excellent way to make it easier to get the glue out. Oops. Okay, so re glue. I'm getting some foaming because of the water and stuff on my brush, but that's okay. 
I'm not putting this on generously. It's just kind of, you know, on there. Just an even coat. You're going to be a little sticky when you get done with this. Okay. Now we look for our mark. Ha, I didn't cover there. I was going to say I covered it up, but I can still see it. I'm going to make that straight. Now we want our wallpaper pattern to be on there with that being north. And we'll adjust it so that we get this lovely big pattern over here. Okay. Get all the bubbles and things out. If you end up with a bubble later, then you can always um, puncture it and squeeze a little glue under there. Okay, like I said, you can use any wallpaper for this. And don't be limited just by my crazy black and white toile, which I love. You can paint any pattern on top. You don't have to paint my stuff. Okay, so I think that's it here. I'm going to go set this under something heavy. I'm going to lay it down on its face. I'm going to put something heavy on top. But before I do that, I want to show you how we're going to trim it. I have to go get a tool. Okay, so what we need, I have our box knife from our shipping department. Preferably, this is much, especially if you're doing a bunch of them, it's better to use a, a a new box knife because the sharp the the edge will be very sharp. But I really like those um, pencil thin um, like snap knives. They're a craft type function. And what you'll do is you put this on a surface that you don't want to mar, and then you're just going to run the knife right next to the edge and go all the way around the edge, and that will make it perfectly adhered. But you've got to do that when it's dry. Okay, so. I'm not going to do that step right now, but that is how you'll do it. Okay, the way that you can get your line on a clock or a round surface um, and the edges of band boxes and stuff like that is to use a compass. What's unique about this compass is it looks like a pen and it doesn't have, let me see if I can find one of my other ones. Um, this is a mechanical, pencil, uh, mechanical type drafting um, compass that Statler makes and they're wonderful, they're fine to use and they have a wheel that you widen and they have a point and they have the lead. What happened to me, I was um, teaching a class and I needed a compass because I use them in class all the time and this little wheel um, I think you know had gotten loose and the lead fell out. Well you do not find compass leads anywhere in the country at any store that I've ever found. Um, I ended up spending another ten dollars on a new compass because the lead fell out and I did finally find um, refills, and they are available on the website just as a service to the compass using world. But the half pipe solves that for you because it actually has compass leads that store in the base. So if you lose your lead, then you can put them right back. You can get your refill right out. And then when you buy a refill, you can just dump a few in there, and that way you always have your refills handy. This is also protected. It doesn't have that wide bar. What I found... Um, with my brush box. I was putting this in with my brushes this way and if you think about your brush and one of these things going in through the middle of your bristles um, it can be quite damaging. So when I found this that has a cap that protects the point and doesn't have that wheel I was delighted. So this uses, you just use your fingers to spread it apart. It has a, a pretty good uh, tightness to it but you obviously don't want to hold it like that real tight so what you do is when you get it the way that you want it you hold it up here in the top on its grip. Okay, So then the way you do that is you line that up with where you want your line and you simply make, whoops, you got to keep that edge on there. You simply make your mark. Now what you do have to do is you have to make sure that the edge stays even and that your hand is upright. If you lean then you'll change the way that that your compass is marking. Okay, so let me show you on something a little bit smaller. That isn't already black. This has got, I'll show you what this is for in a minute. So you just mark it right on the edge. I have a little twirling device. There you go. So now you have a perfect line scribed on to your piece. Okay, so what we did, because we had a class full of these to do, my husband Ted 
um, he cut a circle the diameter that we wanted it and he put a, a little dowel through it that goes in the middle right there into the piece sort of um, and then you can just make your mark all the way around now I have a really really interesting situation going on here I have um, when you're painting black and you've got just a little light pencil mark on there because you don't want to make a big mark um, you know I I base coated this um, I am totally wonked out on this corner over here I mean I absolutely wonked out so one of the things that you can use to help you unwonk is you can use a little bit of stretchy tape you need good light so you might get out your little light as you're trying. I think if I'd have had better light, I don't think I'd have had the problem that I had. So now I can see that line. So A, seeing is believing, right? We've got to be able to see. Okay. And I'm going to peel my little stretchy tape. This is the eighth inch. Okay. And then I can just take it on the edge of my line, get my line done. You know, I can move that light closer. I can put on my magnifying glasses and I can tape my line York, lift, tape, and this tape will actually stretch to your circle, okay, so that it's the way that you want it to. Now I have a little flat edge there. I do recommend when you're using stretchy tape to use shorter segments because if you get it flat like that is, then you need to take it back out and you need to fix it. And all you do is just lift back up, okay, so now that, that's not so flat right there. And then when I fix this to my line, then that's going to be nice and even. It would help if you could see. So your steps are going to okay. be that you are going so to glue so down and apply hence for getting your wallpaper to circle onto your claw. claw. You're going to allow it to dry for 24 hours. Then you're going to scribe on your circle, whatever width that you want. Um, if you have the pattern, then you know what width to use. And you're going to adjust it for your size clock. Like this is 14 inches and that other one was 18. Um, you're going to get this painted black and then you're going to trace your pattern on. And then the way that we're going to do, bring the finished sample up here for you. Okay. The way that we're going to do this, by the way, these clocks look beautiful on an easel in your kitchen. Um, you know, you can do a small one up on the, above the cabinets. You can put it on the countertop. You wouldn't want to do that with this one, but um, don't just think of clocks as things that need to be um, placed on the wall. Um, really, really this size and... Um, this size and down look just wonderful as part of, you know, something on your coffee table. Okay, so we've got our twelve. So what we're going to do? We've got our black on. Okay, we're not going to we're not going to trim out until the end. So we'll talk about that later. Next week, what we're going to do is we're going to do feathers and our our body right here. The following, we're going to do work on his head and eyes because you know eyes and head and. This stresses people out a little bit more. So we'll take our time with this and show in microscopically close detail so that you know where you're highlighting and all that. Then the final week is going to be doing our geraniums down here and finishing. Okay, so that's that's my plan. All right, this is, let me turn it around so you can see it. This is one of the banners that I painted. It's called Summer Wishes. And there is a little butterfly who is summertime. We've got little ladybugs which are also summertime. And I'm in, I'm in love with all these parts of um, summertime. We've got um, my fantasy version of lightning bugs, um, and then I have the dandelions, which I think dandelions are just precious and wonderful. I have so many happy childhood memories of, you know, finding these and blowing them and making wishes and wishes coming true and all that kind of stuff. And I think ladybugs are lucky, and I think butterflies are gorgeous. And so... This is called Summer Wishes. Anyway, there's my little history. But I want to talk about making a mistake. Okay, so say I'm going to get um, a light, light, light green color. Oh, hang on a second. Let me find it. What I'm going to do is make an intentional mistake. Okay, so that you can see what I'm talking about. Here's what I see when I teach classes, because I get to teach, you know, all over the country. Um, and what I see is people get into an area, like maybe they'll go onto the face or they'll make a bad float for one of these um, jewels or something like that. And I'll see them, or maybe maybe even, and maybe you can relate to this, I've certainly been there myself, but, you know, I'm all self-taught, so, you know, don't, 
don't ever feel like I'm there's ever a lecture coming because guess what it's all from experience and all from making dumb mistakes but what happens is like maybe you're in a bad float day and so instead of putting down the brush you continue and you're like is this float bad and well if you're asking yourself that question then it probably is so believe yourself when you ask it that you do know what you're talking about okay put the brush down wash it out and then go review the technique that you need for that piece. So what I would like to suggest, A, is that you learn to stop when you are struggling. But let's say I've got some of this light green color and I'm coming over here and that's actually a perfect color but let's go lighter, let's go white. Say I get my white over there and I don't realize I've got my white going and then I come over here and I've got this, you know, kind of highlight dry brush kind of thing going. But this, after I move, let me get closer in for you. Okay, after I move, and it's really almost not obnoxious enough, but I think you're getting the idea. After I move across, I look at it and I go, wow, you know, that's, that's really not making me very happy. But I'm happy with this, 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 this. There's a couple of things that you can do. Number one, you can go back one step, okay? And what that means is instead of this, so what I had is I had this green plus white. To make that light green and then I just went ahead and used straight white because I, that was already a light green. So if I have this very very bright spot right there, okay, there's a couple of th things that you can do. Um, I'm going to show you the first one because it's the easiest. While your paint is fresh, which means like within five minutes of it, um, let's get some more light on the subject, within five minutes of drying, then I've got this product called a wave eraser and it comes in a little case to protect it and it's a real sturdy um, white eraser that product like we we all have them but it's got these points and chisels on it what you can do is you can dip into I've got my foam roller in there into water and you can go right over here on your error and you can erase it away now that paint was wet still and I'm talking about if your paint is actually dry but see now that product that paint is off okay but if I wanted to erase um, say my graphite lines on already dried paint so like right over here then I can go right next to it and it doesn't harm my paint at all okay so it is dry it doesn't it just takes off your um, pattern and wet it will remove your mistakes so it erases mistakes and it erases chalk lines so what you can do also, this is like problem solving 101, right? Say I don't like how bright that is. I actually do like how bright that is. I'm going to get that off of there because it's changing the colors on the camera. Okay. Say I don't like how bright that is. I can go back a step. So if white was my step, I could go here. But I think I'm actually going to go green. Go green. Because I think this is a pretty transparent color. And transparent means it doesn't cover so I'm going to go back one step and I would just give that a little bit of makeup. Okay, so now I've toned it down. I would not just make up, like if I have, you know, just a ladybug here, I wouldn't just make up right on that spot. I would do into the next area because you don't just make up on your cheeks if you have a blemish. You make up your whole face because then the whole thing looks uniform. Okay, so if I want to... Um, if I want to correct something, you can just simply go back one step. The other thing that you can do is, pardon my rinsing. Okay, so if we have, oh, you know, we've got Sally Painter, and sorry, anybody who's Sally that's watching, watching we, we'll call it Patty Painter. We've got Patty Painter has gone along, and she's got this area, and she has just, she has made, maybe, maybe we'll just call it this area. She started her floats in here, and this area just, sucks bad okay it's just really really terrible what can we do about it well we could base coat the whole thing green but I think that that's a little excessive okay let me get what you can do is you can take a little foam sanding disc okay and then you can sand now this doesn't have varnish on it so I'm not going to sand you can sand down any bumps that you have like if you floated in a chunky type way you can sand it all down, okay, and get it smooth, and then get out your flat brush or your whatever base coat brush, 
and then just go ahead and base that area again. Trace that pattern on again and just restart in this area. If you like this and you like this and you like this but you're just dying because this is awful, sometimes do go back but don't erase everything. Don't start all over again. I think that that's, that's really sad. I hate to see people do that. Okay, we have a new product. Um, it's called Living the Creative Life and it's a book that comes highly recommended. Um, if you've ever wanted to create your own art and you've always gone like, oh, I'm not very creative and I, I can't draw and, and I just don't know where I would get new ideas, this is the book for you. Or maybe you're just a designer that's feeling a little stuck. That's why I own this book is because, you know, I get stuck. We all get stuck. And maybe you need a fresh burst of inspiration. One of the things that they talk about in here is they talk about the journal as inspiration. Okay. And they have different, um, they go through, let me talk about the book for a second. Um, they have different activities and they have all these artists. This is a very, very um, creative, inspiring book and, and it has excellent advice in it. So, um, and it comes from artists that make a living at doing what they do. So, but they talk about um, the journal's inspiration. It's a source of endless inspiration no matter what it looks like or what you use. Violet keeps a blog, a kind of online journal. Um, I use a scrap of paper to record and uh, drawer labeled originals where I pop the ideas into. Okay, and then several blank books and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's journaling. And what I'd like to share with you is my journal, okay, which is a disaster. Okay, um, and so this is a disaster. I have Toll TV the first week, and I've got... Um, you know, a design down here that's called Art Happens. It's a painting surface, so you can actually paint on it and personalize it. And it comes with a little rubber band. I use this all the time. Let me grab my pile. These are some of my past journals. I have them on a special shelf, and they are always handy to me because if I need an idea, then I'm going to go back into my other journals because I can't do everything all at one time. This was a neat journal because I traveled a lot last year. So this is last year's journal. And I went to Jo Sonia's color workshop. And I went ahead and worked her creative ideas. It was like a creative type thing, color and creativity. And I worked them right into my journal pages. And so I did my painting into here. Hang on, these are just... I used my color chips to figure stuff out. I did little sampling things. This was an interesting exercise. Okay, but because I did this in my journal and it's not in a notebook or something like that, then I can go through this um, and remember the class better because it's not in like hodgepodgey places. It's not like in worksheet form or something. It is my own handwriting. I wrote it myself. Um, I have squiggly notes. Um, you know, I have, um, let's see, where's more? We had, you know, we brains, we had apple thoughts, you know, so we brainstormed what kinds of apples, apple teapots, triangular apples, apples with worms, all these kinds of things. Um, I painted things, okay, we've got some bad art and some good art. I have a chicken in here I'm pretty proud of, oh, a bird, that's right. So she had us look at a picture and then sketch it once and then immediately sketch it again and again. And she says after, I think, did she say ten times or three times? I can't remember. Um, and if I had a note, it would be good. Anyway, she says after about ten times, we'll call it ten times, if you sketch that same bird over and over again ten times, then you will now have a bird that belongs to you. It will no longer look like the original. You will have increased its bottom or its top or its whatever. And then it will have become your own bird that you can then use in a composition of some sort. Okay, the other tool, hang on just a minute. Okay, I'm back. The other two tools, I guess, that you can use, um, I have my phone here and I have my camera here. This is my big camera that I use here in the studio, which almost is ready to be replaced. But if you take and you put a camera, a little camera, in your purse and take it with you everywhere, um, I just, I, I will share in this issue, I'll have it on the side of the website, a picture that I took on my way into the doctor's office. I think it is the most glorious thing on my screensaver. Um, I just absolutely adore it. 
So, but if I hadn't had a camera, I wouldn't be able to lock that moment into history. And creativity-wise, it has inspired me in so many ways, just that one picture. So then you can also take pictures with your camera, so, I mean, with your phone. So sometimes, you know, just keeping your phone camera with you and learning how to use it, because I know a lot of us have phones. I didn't know how to use my camera in the last one. They get very worn out. What disgusted me was the color. <laughs> I really am not a fan of black unless I'm going to paint something wonderful on it. So, um, last year, this is last year's, um, last year this was my final black year, and I found, the reason for that is, is I found a source for these that um, is built the same way as these, um, and these were expensive, these were like $20, these are like 8 Anyway, um, I found a source that had the same type of paper that's stitched, has our pocket in the back, has our rubber band to keep everything closed together, and it comes in like six or eight colors, including black. But um, I was delighted with this. So this year I got to carry around my little green book. The other thing that I like about this size book is this is purse-sized. You can put it into a fairly compact purse, and like this sticks right to the top of my um, my purse, and my purse is fairly small by <laughs> purse standards. Um, so anyway, they fit inside. Now, if you are interested, I, I have a series of, and this is just going on the creative side, I have a series of how-to um, technique DVDs. And this one is called Design a Project. When you design and when you're being creative, um, it's not always necessary. You don't have to invent a bird. Um, you do not have to invent a palette. You do not have to, um, you do not have to, like, arrive at the whole artist's place finished. And so what I show you in here is how to use, oh, I guess tips and tricks and, and um, you know, how to find color inspiration, how to, I guess, how to begin to design and how to actually pull a project together. And I actually show one working all the way through its steps. So that is available on the website as well for a creative, um, a creative type inspiration. All right, well, I hope that you have enjoyed our first week of Toll TV. Um, this is an idea that I wanted to, um, have wanted to share for a long time. I think that there's so few opportunities to learn more about our craft out there that, that are free. You know, I really do believe that um, we can all share and the world will just grow with us. It, I, we don't have to, um, you know, be close-fisted with our universe. We can share openly and... Um, and still benefit and prosper and all that kind of stuff. So every week that you join me, it will be free. Um, we have every week we will have tips, tricks, techniques, and tools, and um, a little bit of shameless advertising. Sorry about that part, but we won't break for irritating commercials. I promise, if we're advertising, that we will advertise in an educational way. Okay, have a great week. Hello, welcome to Toll TV. My name is Patricia Rawlinson, and I'll tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been painting for 20 years, and I'm a self-taught painter and designer. Um, when YouTube and Viddler and different things came on the internet, I realized that now was the time that I could offer a contribution for other painters who are self-taught or, you know, not able to get to classes or just as passionate as I am about painting. Um, so Toll TV is my contribution, and I hope that you find it informative. Um, the camera is going to be focused on my hands all the time. I, it's taken me about 200 outtakes for me to get this face shot done. So um, it, it always goofs me up. As long as it's on my hands, I feel like I'm talking to you. But if it's on my face, I can't seem to keep it straight. So anyway, um, every week we'll just focus on the lesson and the painting and you'll get to see up close as much as possible um, what I'm doing and I'll hopefully share some interesting things with you. I hope you enjoy. All right, we left off last week with our project um, where we had weighted this down. We have our toile on there and we've got it on straight and it's nice and glued. 
Um, I showed you how to do it just so you can move ahead, but I'm going to show it on this issue as well. You just take your knife, make sure that you're not cutting um, the, the surface that you have underneath. So what we'll do is we'll put the cardboard underneath there. We'll tuck our little knife, which should be that razor, razor sharp knife, and you hug it right along the edge of this. Okay, and see how nicely that cuts. How brilliant is that? And then it's going to look perfect on the front side. Okay, I'm all trimmed up. And the cool thing about this um, center, cool little trick, is in order for this to be nice and clean, what you do is you just poke a hole in it towards towards the back, and that will tuck all of that stuff right down in the middle of it um, so it's not rough edged up. And then your works and hands and stuff will all screw and attach into this hole right there. Okay, um, so while I was getting my paints out for this project, um, I wanted to remind myself, um, I found these perfect totes for um, paints at Ikea. And the reason that they're perfect is that the paints will stand up in here. There's big enough to go up to um, the Traditions size bottles as well. And they have a lid, which makes, it just sits on there, it doesn't snap on. But this makes everything stackable. And because they're clear, I can see into them. And so I could have a palette pulled, or this in this case, this is my mediums. Um, for This is what I have left of the Delta mediums, so when I make a DVD or something and I need it, um, I have them. But they're all put together so I can label them and I know where they're at. But what I had to remind myself of was that I needed more of these perfect containers, and so I thought I'd share them with you. And then while I was doing that, um, I realized that I should share this too. This is, um, this is an iPhone, and I got it about a month ago, and I have to say it's the perfect phone. You can make a shopping list in here for each store that you want to go to, and I was putting in the name and number for my IKEA shopping list because I have to go three hours to get to an IKEA. Anyway, these are absolutely fabulous, and they make them a little bit bigger. They don't sell them online, though, otherwise I would have just ordered them. Oh, and what I wanted to say about this phone, um, just because it is easy, you can get these apps for them, um, applications for them. And this particular one that I downloaded, let me go back, I'll go there, is called Shopper. Anyway, and you can, um, you can make different lists for each place that you need to go. So I've got Ikea, Nursery, Walmart, and Costco. And then you can put a list into each one, and you can email it to yourself. And what I was thinking is that a perfect application for this might be for your paints as you um, you could make a deco art shopping list or a delta shopping list or whatever and then you could keep it with you and that way when you're at the store you would know which ones you needed and where your master list was and you can make a shopping list created from that so um, from a products standpoint where you need to remember um, a whole list of things like that I thought this would be great okay I want to share a tip that I see people use all the time when they're taking classes and that is a beach towel. If you take, you know how sometimes you get things on your table and you don't know what's there and then as soon as, hmm, as soon as you put your piece down or you flip it over then you've marred the whole thing or you've gotten it gumbly. What you can do is you can take a beach towel or any towel, guest towel, bath towel, old towel, folding this puppy in half, I'm going to flatten it out, I'm going to smooth it out, now what I can do is I can use this as my painting surface so that I know what's on this towel. I know that this just came out of the laundry and it's clean and I'm not going to get stuff on my piece. Another really good um, use for these, if you'll take your sewing machine and just seam one, both sides of them, then what happens is it becomes, let me move you down here, if you have that done, it becomes your surface travel bag. So now you have a surface travel bag that will protect your piece from, like if you get rain on this with the paper unexposed and unsealed and unvarnished and stuff, this might not be very good, you know, and sometimes the rain can have acid and different things in it and it'll permanently speckle your paint. So, and if you toss it in the car and the car, you know, goes around the corner too sharp because you're a little, you know, speed maniac, then, you know, you have, you have other problems because then it's tumbling about. That way, if it's this way, if it's in this bag, then you know that it's protected and your piece will make it okay. And this, 
Okay, I'm not going to paint on a towel today because I think the orange is a little bit distracting for the camera. I did want to share though, I have this little easel, I think they're four or five dollars. This is the 14 inch size clock. When I set that easel, my clock right on that easel, then you can see how nice that would look sitting on a shelf or something up on top of your armoire in your living room or something like that. Okay, I went ahead and put the the pattern and the directions out with the conversion on it, and the pattern is still written for Delta Saran Coat colors. The reason I left it like this, I could have changed it, but the reason I left it like this is I thought it would be a better lesson if we dealt with it as part of the lesson. So, um, because you're going to have to deal with this. With Delta having discontinued over a hundred colors, this is a reality for painters. And if you have you know, folk art colors and you don't have Delta colors, then you need, you need some you need some tools, you need some knowledge. So I went ahead and put the, um, the conversions are listed straight across from what the color is. So you'll want to keep both your pattern page and your instruction page um, available so that you can cross-reference. And of course I'm going to talk about it and mark, work our way through it. Okay. Um, I've gathered my paint. What I like about gathering paint in a bucket like this is that um, these loose bottles of paint are not like laying everywhere and getting knocked over. So when they're all gathered, then I can just pick the bucket up and move it and put it away for next week or whatever I want to do. For me as a designer, this also, um, by having only the items I've used inside this bucket, then what that's done for me, I'm going to wedge you out a little bit, what that does for me is it keeps me organized and tells me which paints I've used, and then when I go to write my directions, I just bring the bucket with me, and then um, and I write my directions right from the bucket, and that way I know exactly what I've used, and I don't have to take um, paper notes for each piece of paint and stuff. But when we have, say you're in a class situation, we're going to make this a little bit more about how to mix colors a little bit and how to um, how to use your own palette. Um, I shared this notebook with you the last, um, in the last episode. Um, this is my current one, although it's full, now I'm, now I'm in orange. Um, this was something that I did at Joe Sonia's, and we had to go get a palette, and we had a yellow, a red, a green, a blue, and a violet palette. And so what you can do when you're in class, let me get you in a photo, what you can do when you're in class, if you need to make sure that you can match that paint later on, you can make a little paint chip sample in your notes or in your book. And what I will do a lot of times when I'm designing is I use these um, these manila folders and I might have my list or something like that, my samples over here. However, if I put it in my notebook, I know I won't lose it. And especially if I'm traveling or I'm, you know, I'm at a seminar or something like that, then I'll always make notes of colors in my notebook. Oops, that's that funny exercise. This was weird. It was kind of cool, but it was weird. <laughs> anyway, so you can keep your notes on here, and um, that might be a good thing to do. Um, even as you're working through your pattern, you might go ahead and when you get to, if this is a palette that you're not familiar with or whatever, as you get to black, you can just put a little black chip of paint on there. And then, okay, since we haven't painted together before, I mean, like last week, we kind of sort of painted, sort of. We got ready to paint. Um, this is a gray paper palette. Um, it's kind of cool. On the back side of the cover, whoops, it has a gray scale, so you could rip this off and use it as you go along. And it has colors and then complementary colors as a chart, and it also has a color wheel. So it's like a little tool set all in um, one. Okay. And what's cool about this is that this is neutral. When you mix colors on a white palette, then notice how the camera just got darker because we put all that white in there. All right, same kind of thing when you're mixing colors. If I mix colors on white, you know how black looks so much darker on white than it does on a darker color. Um, and so you might mix, maybe you're mixing a green and you're mixing, say, a, a conversion for like Hauser dark green. And you're trying to mix that on this white palette. Well, what's going to happen is on white, you're going to think that very, very, very dark and it's, you're going to mess with your mind, and you're not going to mix color as accurately. So when you're going to do any kind of color mixing, you'll use a gray palette. And what the gray palette will do for you is, um, it is, let me find my card. 
think you're prepared, and then, you know, maybe not. Okay. My business card, and a lot of you will have this, um, it's a bookmark, and it's got color wheels, and it's got a gray scale, and it's got a ruler on it. Um, but if you notice that we're over here at, like, value 6 or 7 over here, we're kind of towards the middle scale on our value finder. This is a neutral because it's in the middle of the value scale. That means, and value means darkness or lightness. So um, in the middle of our value scale, we have our paper, which is neutral. So lights will look light and darks will look dark, but they won't look extraordinarily light or extraordinarily dark. So for this palette, for this project, we're going to use the gray palette. Um, and I finally have found these in um, the big size. They used to, I can't remember who made them. They used to carry these, and they used to be these little skinny ones, and I think they were like $9 or something, and they had like 20 sheets. And this one has 50 sheets, and I think it retail price is like $7.95. So it's a great value. has 50 sheets, the same as your white palette, and um, I think the white palettes, I think they're pretty comparable as far as price goes, so you can afford to use these is what I since we haven't painted together before, um, I always like to use, I set my palette up a specific way, and you can set yours up any way you like. I'm not like one of those weirdo kind of control freak people. But what I do, um, after years and years of watching people and learning from other people, um, I've learned some things that do work. I always put a dry folded up paper towel up at the top of my palette, and then I put my little collapsible water bin. Um, which is disgusting and filthy because I don't wash it out every day, okay? Um, I'm sure that your water bin is much more attractive than mine. Anyway, so I've got my clean water bin in here, um, and I've switched to using the collapsible water bucket only because um, it does collapse, and I travel a lot, and I teach a lot outside, so um, I, can't, um, I can't always, I can't travel with the hard plastic ones. Um, it also doubles, though, as a water dish for your dog if you put it in your car which I thought was kind of clever. Anyway, so then what I do when I put my paints out, I start at the closest place to the top of these two items, which stay stationary, and I use up this area right here. And then when it's time for me to, when this is all filled up, what I will do is I will flip. I'll take those things off. I'll flip it over. This is where I've been blending and stuff, so this is going to be dry. I'll put my palette right back on top of their paper towel here and then continue with the rest of my palette. If you put your paints out in the middle of your palette, what happens is you run your hand through things. And I've seen more cuffs and more um, ruined projects because people drag their little sleeve because they're freezing in the painting room, drag it through the paint which they put in the middle of their palette, and then drag it onto the edge and all over their freshly painted um, surface. So. If you keep your palette just a little bit organized, um, then, and the other thing that you're not doing when you do this, like you're wondering, are we ever going to paint? <laughs> Sorry, I think these are very helpful tips. Okay, so what happens if you have a paintbrush and you're dipping inside here, and say my water will go back over here. We'll put our palette over on this side, and we've got our water over there. Can I get water? Yeah. All right, so got our water over here. I come dripping across my surface, and I come over here, and then I go over here, and then I come back over here. At some point or another, this travel path, you know, this is going to be the danger zone because you are traveling with wet water and wet paint back and forth across your project. If you're right-handed, probably the best place for your palette, and everything is on the right side of your table, so you don't have to reach across your palette. Okay, so, oops, what did I just do? I hit the remote. Okay, so if we start out like that, and we'll get all straightened out. Um, if we start out like that, then um, we're, all of our hand movement is right over here. Water, paper towel, don't load, blend, rinse, water. You know, it's all right here. We've never traveled over here unless we're actually ready to paint. Okay, so I'm going to clip my light on. The reason I'm using this little light, um, I've got okay light in here, but... What we talked about last week was when you have toile in this graphite line or this pencil line, um, it's not very, um, it's not very um, easy to see. And so what I did is I had biffed my line, and so I need to make up just a little bit. What did I just do? I had a brush. I thought um, I need to make up just a little bit of that. Okay, so I'm going to go over here, rinse, 
dry out my brush, and I'm going <laughs> to... Glasses! Those pesky little glasses, huh? Okay, so then we're just going to sneak up. When you are trying to paint a perfect edge... Okay, let's see if we can get you close. We bought a new camera just so that we could get you close. There we go, yeah. Alright, when you're trying to get close to an edge, if you scoop up a great big wad of paint, you can see that reflecting, and you put it right next to your edge, what you're always going to end up with is a big built up ledge of paint on the edge of your um, piece. And we don't want that. So what you do, get my palette over here for you. What you do is you go into the edge of your paint and you flatten your brush into some paint. So it, there is no built up wad on your brush. Okay. Then you come over here next to your edge. Okay, let's get you on camera. Come over here and you start next to your line, not on top of your line. So you start next to it and then you just stroke it over. And then when you get it so that you think it's right, you give it that firm um, pull towards you when you think that you've got everything right. Okay, and pull towards yourself. So I'm rotating this. Rotate your piece. Don't be afraid to turn your piece. Okay, to get a better angle. So I'm going to come over here, work it towards it, and work it, get it right on that spot, and then do a pull. Nice and smooth, confident pull. If you're confident when you're pulling your stroke or pulling your um, even your base coat, then you're going to have a much more beautiful project because the lines will be smoother. So you have to pretend, even if you have to fake your confidence, okay? So right next to it, sneak up on it, and then, ta-da! It's vibrating. It's just past breakfast time, and I had tea. Okay, so I've got some damage here because this was um, one of the leftover pieces um, that I had from convention, so I'm just going to give those a little swipe. Um, to make sure it's all base coated. I do have six of these left from the last time I taught them. Um, I'll put them on the website this week. They're prepped with black in the middle and um, the paper is on them. So that'll be for like the first six people they get there and they can get them. I'm not prepping anymore, sorry. Okay, while I'm waiting for my piece to dry, then what I want to talk about is my conversion books. I have a Delta and I have a Deco Art and I have a Traditions and I have um, a Jasonia. Um, you could do it for folk art. I've never gotten into folk art paints too much, although I do like their pure pigment paints, but I just never ended up with them. Um, in this notebook, what I have, De DecoArt has a shading and highlighting guide. I'll see if I can't put a PDF of this on the website. Let me make a note. Okay, notes taken. All right. Um, so we have this shading and highlighting guide, and what this is good for is say you do need to make a color substitution and say you want to know um, maybe you're substituting cocoa for, I think that's on our list, um, cocoa for one of the Delta colors and you want to know the perfect color to shade it then you just run across over to the shading color or the highlighting color and it tells you and that it's pretty good I haven't found very many that I've, I haven't liked the um, the colors. What these um, pages are, these are baseball card sleeve pages, okay, and then what these, um, I used cardstock, and I just cut them into um, whatever size these are, let's find out, because I know there will be a question, um, they are two inches by, hey, look at that, three and a half inches, and I just used my um, big, you know, paper cutter type thing, and what we did, um, I had my friend Linda help me, um, you can see these are hers, hers are legible, mine is unlegible, it, it, Inlegible? Unlegible? Anyway, um, she, we got together, we tag teamed it, um, I brought, I had the paints, and she wrote all the names of all the colors and the number on, from the bottle, and you could also print them out on labels, I'll show you that in the next book. But what I can also do is, this is my, del my Delta book, okay? In my Delta book, as you look, even just at this one page, the X's are the ones that were discontinued. I made a chip for every one of these, and then what I did with Delta, I did it as a project online, um, what I had done for this, and let me see if I can find that too. It may not be, it's been years since I did it, um, Delta Project, and I'll post that as well.
on a link and it just download it for interest if you want to. What I had done was I had made these in color families um, to see I was exploring color um, when I was just getting into wanting to know more about color. And I organized them into um, into their color family sort of right now. I could probably redo this and it would be more accurate. But I can take my Napa wine, which is just a wonderful color, and I can take it out of this book. I can go over to this book, I can find my purples, and I can see, okay, Pansy Lavender's almost there, and maybe I want just a hair more black in it. Okay, so these two side by side are much easier to match than it is just to take a conversion book and do it that way. Um, it's the handiest, the handiest thing I've ever spent a lot of time doing. What you can do, helpful hint, is you can go over to a friend's house who has, say, one friend has Joe Sonia, have a painting party. You guys all get together. Um, everybody does, like if you've got three friends, all get together and do three cards, you know, or do it via email, not email, but snail mail. You know, have um, somebody that has colors that wants to make a book, um, you know, get together and, you know, maybe they do 20 cards and you've got 20 people that are all going to swap. As long as the cards are all the same size um, and you, you've got some kind of constant, then, then you should be good to go and then you can just pop them into an envelope. Uh, it doesn't need to be a really tough thing is what I'm trying to say. Um, the other thing that I had done with these is I had put the, I did these on labels, which was much nicer. And I really do like having the value pre-printed on there. Um, it, it's very, very helpful when somebody says get a value two green, you're like, uh, what's that mean? You know, so it, it is very, very handy to have the value. And I haven't done that with my deco arts yet. Anyway, and then what I had done with these is I had used the back of my old business cards, and they're the perfect size, and that's why I ended up with this size. Also, um, I had cut um, little construction paper inserts that are wider so that the color isn't, I don't have that other card behind it showing through. Once you have your book made, you will be a very happy camper. I don't know why this is in here. I think because it's part of the color family, and we need to see it. Okay, so that's, that's, I'm talking about this because we will be converting paints. And that is how I converted the paints. I don't go from a list because I think they're inaccurate. So what I had done is I just took every color that I called for in Delta in the pattern and I matched it to my chips and deco art. So I could put that book away. One more note on these. What I had done was, um, when I'm talking about color and stuff, I wanted to see if we couldn't find the pure pigments in deco art because I think sometimes maybe it's just easier just to mix. Not, not having 500 colors and just mix. What I had done is I had made true red as like um, a pure pigment type color and then I had made a wash. You can see the actual color when you wash um, much better. When you add water or white to a paint you can see its actual values a lot easier. Anyway, so I had done um, a wash of it so I could see a little bit clearer what, what kind of red it was. And then on this side I had added whites and on this side I had added, well I guess this way, black to it. Okay, so a little bit of black. Let's see what it does. This is like the perfect like black plum kind of color. Who knew that true red was like black plum's mother, you know what I mean? And our last note on color that um, on the website, it's a little shameless advertising here, uh, on the website we have this Colors Everything book this is a really nice read, and what I like about this, I don't want you to tell me the color is, and go mix this, and all that, Ugh, I hate it. Um, but chapter 6 has how, how to analyze and improve a good painting, and he actually goes through and he shows you an example, and um, then on the next page, and he talks about what he liked, didn't like, and all this kind of stuff, and on the next page, he brings in the color theory behind his decision to then add just a little bit of purple on the, this piece. Let me um, control. Okay. Bend this open. We'll go telephoto. I think it's fascinating. I want to know how to fix my art. I don't want to just do bad art. You know, and you do need to know this even if you're pattern painting because sometimes you might be smarter than your teacher. Okay, so there is the before. Okay, and then after he used his color theory, and there is the after, and it's so much more interesting when he added in just a little bit of purple. But you don't have to know this. You can use a tool called a color wheel, this is my worn out thing, um, to help you 
analyze what you already know, like what kind of green that is, what kind of yellow that is, or gold, um, and then you use your color wheel to help you make decisions. And it's got little clues and little hints and things like that on them, so you don't have to figure it out. And that's what he's talking about here with his little arrows and things like that. So this is a book where he actually gives you practical color advice, and then he goes through um, a bunch of artists and talks about what they do with color as well. Um, very interesting read. It's, it's uh, not so deep that it's painful. Anyways, color is everything. All right, we're going to talk about your pattern. I'm being lazier than all snot, and I am using these cheater um, things that also came with the um, their vellums that I had printed out for my class. So I will get you up here on camera. Um, when you're going to be painting, when you're going to be painting, hmm, grammatically speaking, I think that might have been a really bad thing. You want to make sure with this particular thing that you pay attention to the twelve pattern. Make sure that you get it as upright as you can, because you do not want leaning twall. I don't think that that would be attractive. So you get that horizon line kind of going in the right direction. And you lay your pattern out and get it where you might think. You've got to pay attention to this hole. If I'm going to have this hole like right where his eye is, that would be dumb. So I don't want his feathers to be off. I don't want... He's unbalanced a little bit where this is um, small and then his tail is big, but we do have this green kind of balancing each side, so I'm thinking we'll lay him out, get him kind of straight on there. Okay, that's probably all right. Um, yeah, we'll leave him just like that. Okay, so what you can do, if I have my tape, you take a little piece of tape, oops, Actually, this should be done first. Take my little scissors. And this stuff doesn't cut or doesn't tear very well, so I'm going to stab this area right here. Those of you who have the 100 Tips and Tricks DVD will recognize this tip from that. You get all lined up. Now I've got to reline it up. Silly of me. Then what you can do, you get it where you want it, you can just take your piece of tape and you tape from side to side on that. And what this helps is it doesn't allow the pattern to shift um, when you're tracing. Um, this is a, um, it's got a yellow side to it. This is a piece of tracing pa transfer paper, sorry. It's a wax-free transfer paper. And this will erase. Um, some transfer papers will not erase. This is not the one that does with water. This is the one, I learned about this from David Jansen. Um, it's just a highly superior. You never want to throw a piece of transfer paper away. Um, you ne I mean, like, really never. Um, I don't think I've thrown very many away. I have a big pile of them back here. What happens is the more worn out they get, the better they are. Like, here's a brand new one if in black or in gray. If I use this one on a really light surface, it is going to make the darkest, darkest lines, and so much graphite will go on there. When I have a new piece of graphite, what I do is I take a paper towel. It's not really gunky. It doesn't really come off, but I rub hard on it to make sure, and I am getting quite a bit of um, gray off of there. That way, when I go on to my very first piece that I do trace or transfer, I'm not going to be so disgustingly dark that, um, you know, that it makes problems for me. So, and I am a pig about just tearing off a corner or something like that. I am not a fan of putting this graphite, and I'll tell you why, underneath. Like, say we get it all lined up and you have it on the whole, you've got the whole piece of graphite on there. What happens when you do that, as you're tracing the little eyeball, 
the heel of your hand, that bony thing on your wrist right there, is rubbing into this graphite down here. And so it's not a good idea to ever, um, to ever, um, you know what I'm saying. You don't want to have your hand resting on the part that you are tracing. So what I do is I start up here at the top, my hand is down here, and then I'll move it down as I go. Um, the nice thing about using, you know, see-through paper or whatever is that you can tell um, where your graphite is. An error that we see all the time, and I know everybody's done it, but we'll talk about it, is put their graphite paper on upside down. Got it this way instead, and you get the whole thing traced, and then you look, and you go, ah, you know? So what you can do is you can put a word on there that you would have to read. Okay, so you can put the word top on there. And then you'll know that you're looking for the word top. And, you know, hopefully you will not make that mistake. Okay, glasses coming on. And so what we do is the other thing you only want, I'm using a really ultra-fine stylus. They sell, I didn't know this until like a year or so ago, that they sell styluses in various um, tips. And I myself prefer the finest that they sell because, not because it's like a Cadillac or something like that, but I want the thinnest line on my pattern. I don't want to be inundated with thick pattern lines. Okay, and you want to remember that you've got good close-up pictures. We're going to be working on the leg. So get out your Red Flexi or your Eureka multi um, multi-tasking um, tool and clip your picture up so that you can get a good bird's eye view of exactly what we're going to be doing. And you know this is going to be a tough one for some of you because this rooster is a little bit loose. He's a loosey goose. And what that means, I'm shaking up my paint, sorry. Um, what that means is that he is not like um, put the tail stroke on this right side of feather two. You're going to be flicking a little bit and, and making some, you know, loose strokes. So right now what I'm looking for is one of Patty's favorite dry brushes. And that's a four. You could use a four or a six. I think I'm going to be happier with a six. I used to have a really, if I had combined a six, my brushes tend to walk away when I'm teaching. Hmm. I have a lot of eights. I guess I'm using an eight. Okay, so what you can do when you're using um, a brush that's bigger than your area, maybe that you would prefer, then what you do is you use light touch. If you are using a brush that's too small, then you would use heavy touch and then I'll splay the brush out. Okay, so I'll just go ahead. We've already talked about base coating. So you see how close, I haven't tested this camera out to see how close I can really get in there. Liking it. So what we want to do is we just want to go ahead and give a base coat to the um, feather breast area. Use the chisel of your brush, okay, to do the areas that need to be um, tiny. So your brush can make like a liner or it can be like a flat, okay. So just by turning the angle, keep your brush upright and you want to be precise on the edge and not so precise inside his breast feathers. Okay, I went and got out my Artist Buddy. Um, this is it's got a handle on it. Oops, let's get you on camera here. It's got a handle on it. It's portable. Um, what this does, it's got this rubberized bar mat stuff on it. That's glue that you see there. It's got a little device back here. I can find it. And some, a bunch of adjustments down here. I can adjust my piece so that I can paint it upright to myself, which is going to save my back. A lot of us have really bad backs because we have spent so much time hunched over our table. Anyway, so you can see that that gets us up where we need, but oh no, it's turning. What do we do about that? Well, we can play with it. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, this little device that is tied onto your piece locks underneath, and that locks you so that you can paint upright and keep it still and you can just take it out to adjust it. Okay. The reason I got it out is because when we're painting a chicken like this, what we have, the situation that we have, is I'm going to need to turn him quite a bit and it's just a little irritating to always be like shuffling. And I also want to reduce any wear and tear on the edges of my wallpaper um, by holding it with my hands. 
because um, if I'm holding it, obviously, then what's going to happen is I'm going to fray my little edges and it's going to wear. Um, whether or not that matters, you know, just be gentle with your project. So um, I think that's dry. I think I talked it to, to dry. I'm going to go ahead and give it a second coat. Okay, let's get you in close and I'll show you what I just did. You never know quite when you're going to have a little teaching moment here. Okay, so I'm base coating this little guy right here. Get you in there. Let's see what I've done is I've run over, I've run over the edge of my piece. This is where I'm going to use this wave eraser. Okay, I'm going to dip it in water, and then I'm going to come right over here, and I'm going to erase that mistake just on the edge because it's got the, it's a firm eraser with a nice chisel edge. Okay, and now I have it perfectly wonderfully clean. Okay, um, still not covering very well. This is coat number three. Oh well. Sometimes colors are just like that. What you can do if you ever want um, to skip, like say you want to mass produce or something like that, what you can do is you can undercoat with a more opaque color that's similar, like maybe like cocoa or, um, and there you go. There's, there's a perfect time to use our book. Okay, that's wet, so we'll get rid of that. Okay, we know that we have, we're in the brown family. Okay, we know that we are using traditional raw sienna. Well, whoops, you can't see nothing. Sorry about that. Okay, what a great time to use our book. You know that you're using traditional raw sienna. You've got your pages by browns right here. So it's very easy to see which one of these colors is um, going to be similar. Okay, so what you can do is you want to look for the one that bases the best. Well, I'm thinking right next door here with terracotta, that would probably be great. And then I do know that cocoa works. Okay, so out of those choices, I would probably, I would probably choose the lighter one and do cocoa. But what a great use. So you know you need a color that's similar, um, and you just take out your book, and then you can go to your shelves. I have my paints um, organized um, by letter. I don't do them by number because that doesn't, that's only applicable if you want to order them. Um, on the website, we do carry the entire deco art line of, of paints, uh, the Americana paints, and they are organized by name and by number, so whichever way that you like. But, okay, the next two colors we're going to get out is Burnt Umber, and, you know, I can't pick up a bottle of paint without shaking it, isn't that funny? Burnt Umber, and then um, Burnt Umber is a straight um, translation, and we're going to do Spice Tan. Um, which is cocoa. Okay. And just an aside, did you know that the reason you can't get your paint bottles opened is because this little goober thing dries on there? Um, so if you clean those off, then you open your paint bottles a lot easier. But in the meantime, and there's a little free pattern on the website for this, I have my little bottle opener nugget, and we sell these, we call them painter's thumbs. Um, I used to have a a callus on my thumb and it used to bleed. But I set this, let's see if I can get this on there so you can see it. I set this over the top and then you just let the leverage of popping it back um, open the container. And so, and gosh, if I could get that on camera. So you just set the, rest this, rest this across and then it just pries it open. And it's got a little um, place to, a little place to put, okay, we're not doing that. It's got a little place to put a chain if you want to, and um, this little rosebud pattern is free online. And we have a snowman and a and a Santa Claus as well, and they're just free little download patterns. Anyway, so we've got our three colors out. I'm go back out so you can see the palette. Okay. Got my palette here. All right, and what we're going to want to do? I'm working upside down to myself. Okay, and you do want to work upside down to yourself. I'm going to lock my wheel. Um, you want to go ahead and pick up a little bit of your raw sienna in your brush. You can just kind of, you know, wet that area a little bit. And you're going to use the dip into a little, I'm dipping flat. I'm not dipping and scooping. Dip into a little bit of burnt umber, work it into your brush. And then you want to make these kind of chiseled looking kind of feathery 
little kind of stroke slip slapped kind of in an up and down kind of fashion which doesn't make any sense until you're doing it and then you go yeah I totally understand now and do it in a, a directional type um, movement you want to go maybe into a little bit of raw sienna if you don't like something I don't like how that was so dark so as he comes up his breast you're going to change directions to go up his breast and you'll go into a little bit of the um, cocoa. Mix just a hair of the traditional burnt sienna in with that cocoa um, because you don't want this to be glaring at you. And I'm using kind of the chisel of my brush just to give kind of an indication of, say, layered feathers. Okay. And now we'll do it a little bit brighter. Keep the brightest parts in the highest parts. For example, if something is round, then this edge over here is not going to be where it sticks out to the viewer the most. You're going to be more in this area. Same thing on his leg. The area that the viewer will sense is sticking out should be the area that's lightest because that would be lightest if it was a real item. Okay, so just get some feathery looking things and got a little dark. Don't forget your fingers are excellent cleanup tools. A little bit more burnt umber. Take it next to the edge. Don't leave that edge um, empty over there. Okay. And I think for right now, we'll just pretend like that's plenty. Soften it a little bit. Um, what I like to do is I like to adjust my colors when I get to the end of something. So I might, um, I might be painting along and I might know that there's a problem in a specific area. Um, you know, I might see it, but I will not maybe correct it right away. Okay, so you saw me jumping back and forth between the palette. Let me bring it in close. One of these days I'll set this up so I have a two-camera situation going on. Okay, so it's kind of a mess, right? Now that you have seen me do it with the palette, I think that's just as important sometimes. I'm not pressing, I am using the side of my brush. I'll make a couple of these strokes at you so you can see it up close. What I'm doing is I'm on the chisel of my brush and I'm just kind of almost pecking at it. Okay. Go down here. Add some feathers in there. Okay. Just pecking at it. Pick up dirty brush. The next color. Just peck at that. Remember from last week's lesson. If I had a horrid, you know, we'll make, we'll make one, Burnk. if I do that, okay, oh my gosh, I've ruined the project. First of all, get the extra paint off of there. Okay, so we would rescue it just by being calm and taking the paint off. But it's still quite a mess right there. I can go back one step to our base coat, and I can just mask that, and then I can go back to the colors that I put on top of that, and I can then fix that area. Okay, so just remember last week, we just step back one and use that eraser if you need it because it'll take off that dry paint as long as it's wet. Okay, so I think we're going to leave our um, legs like that. We're going to let it dry and have that be enough feathery type stuff right now. Now we're going to just use a flat brush and burnt umber, and we're going to shade, highlight, or float, whatever word you like to use. Um, I do have, shameless advertising, right? Um, I do have a How to Float DVD online that, even if I say so myself, is exceptional. It shows you every way to get around floating and make it easy for yourself, which is, you know, why should painting be so difficult? Okay, so we're going to go over here and we are going to just float to separate. I've got to see where my pattern is. Let's see where the line goes. There's like a little back leg over there. Okay, so just bring it up over there. And then we'll come over here and just shade to the front. Give that little back leg just a little bit of a shade. Okay. Don't cut through your wet floats. If you cut through your wet floats, then you will end up with a mess. Now we can't leave 
that um, project. Oops, let me get you on camera. You can't leave that project, um, this um, leg area, sticking out bright from the feathers that'll be on top. We want to tuck in a little bit of dark underneath there. Boy, these cameras are amazing. I mean, talk about being able to see the details, huh? Okay, we're not worried about this being pretty. Um, he's a bird, and these are feathers, and they're just impressionistic feathers. So what we're interested in more is line and the color balance. Okay, and so that's our, our chicken breast. Okay, here we go. So our wing feathers, which are... We do our wings, and we're going to stop at the wings. Um, you know, really, truly, total painting time, um, not very long. So this is a very doable project if you want to paint along. The um, video will be left up after I'm done with April. It'll be left up as an April archive, so you'll be able to go back and watch this again and again, um, you know, or whatever. You can't download it to your computer um, because, you know, I really don't want it to be a copied situation. But um, you can watch it as many times as you want. It's there for you. We are going to offer it for sale. Um, we'll put a button up there um, so that you can pre-order April's episodes. They'll all be included, all four episodes for the month, and it'll be the entire project will be in there. It'll be just like it was, just like it is on YouTube on the Fiddler video that you can watch. Now we want to get this going in the right direction, so we want to make sure that we're stroking our feathers towards us. Okay, and we'll just give them, I've got my dog Jenny here, we have two dogs now, we have Jenny, who is the sweetest little thing, I'll put a picture up, and then we have Ace the Wonder Dog, who is crazy, and we love him too, but, okay, so just kind of shape following, you can let some of that black, you know, kind of show through if you want to, probably a little bit of black in with this, would it be a miss, I don't think. Just kind of dirty brushing that. Okay, see how that's starting to look like feathers. You can cut straight across where these feathers are going to droop over so that you don't have a big space there. And you can cut right up into these neck feathers. And on the chisel of my brush again, I'm come out just a little bit wider so you can see. Okay, and bringing it in, make sure you go on around through the clock hole so that you don't end up with a hole there. Okay, and so we have our wing feathers are stroked. They're shaded with black. Okay, so there's some black in there. We'll just dirty brush our dirty brush into the black, and you know just make some some wing. Um, these are longer feathers. Okay, so just some wing type feather things, highlighted with raw sienna. So I'm gonna pick up raw sienna. I wiped my brush out. I'm gonna have to wipe it out a little bit stronger. The black will take over. Wiped my brush out, and then I'm going into the raw sienna. I'm going to go on the forward parts of the wings. Okay, a little bit more. I don't want it to become too bright. Just more towards the base of the wing. And then we're going to do, I oh, what it says, let's see, plus candy bar brown. Candy bar is our conversion for candy bar is... See, candy bar is one of my favorite colors. Um, antique maroon. Okay. That. So funny, that's a maroon color, but it's such a chocolate colored maroon, you know? And so we're going to get our, looking at my picture, get a little bit of that red kind of brown going in there. Do you see what I mean? This is not a put your, put your paint right here kind of project. Now what I am going to do is flip myself over and go into a little bit of our cocoa and then I want to have just a little bit, let me get you on camera, a little bit of a lined feathered look just right on the front leading edge there. And I think for right now, I think I'm going to leave that. I'm okay with that. Um, what's going to happen is when we add these other feathers and things like that, we're going to see that we want maybe a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that. And so we'll go back through and we'll tickle um, the colors.
All right, so that's where we're at today with our twelve chicken. Ooh, I'm gonna get you straight. And I hope that you've enjoyed the project. And I'll see you next week. Okay, as part of our shameless advertising, I would like to introduce you to the coolest thing. This is a giant 12 inch long um, clothespin. These are, <laughs> these are so cool. They stand up and they can be photo holders or recipe holders. They come in 6, 9, and 12 inches, which is just great. Um, these make excellent picture holders. I think probably the 9 inch is great for when we're um, at painting class because it's about where you would want your picture to be. Um, I have several patterns um, for them that are um, on the website. And then next week we have a little sneak, um, a little sneak peek. Um, we have Juanita Denton has done patterns on these for us as well. So we have um, like a little guest artist moment going on with our little clothespins. So these are just fabulous. I mean, they're cheap. You can make them as gifts. They're quick to paint. Um, they're just an amazing little project. An okay, in the next new project, new um, surface to paint on that I'd like to share with you is our little mini wine bottle apron. It is so cute. This is an empty wine bottle. I drank the contents and it the apron just slides over the top of the wine bottle and you tie it on the back. You can paint any pattern on the front of the apron. You would do it just like fabric painting. And then the little chef's hat goes, you just adjust it because it's kind of flattened in its packaging, and it goes on to the wine bottle. And now when you bring a bottle of wine to your next dinner party for a hostess gift, you have a darling little gift. Okay, now this just elevates it. It just makes it everybody chuckle and it just elevates the gift. The um, pattern that I have available is on the website. Hello, welcome to week three of Toll TV and our twal, pronounced T-W-A-L-L, -L, rooster clock. Okay, so I wanted to share, last week I was out of these. This is our Eureka Mighty Fine, our Eureka Multitasking Tool. And it clips on items, and you can, this is on a little um, Q-tip dispenser, and it has three arms and air. Hello, welcome to week three of Toll TV and our twal, pronounced T-W-A-L-L, -L, rooster clock. Okay, so I wanted to share, last week I was out of these. This is our Eureka Mighty Fine, our Eureka Multitasking Tool. And it clips on items, and you can, this is on a little um, Q-tip dispenser, and it has three arms, and every point of them, sorry, let's see if I can get you out a little bit further, every point pivots. So that one pivots, that one pivots, this down here pivots, here, 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 and here. Each of the clips is different, but what's lovely about this is that when you have three excellent close-up pictures like we have for this piece, um, you can have them all right in front of you at face level, at eye level, um, so that you can see what you're doing. So always make sure your pictures are out. I think that's a big thing that I see when people are painting is that they forget um, to make sure they're faced with their pictures and it gets a little confusing. Apparently last week I snuck out of the lesson without really saying anything about how I got this black on here. So I'm going to adjust that right now. Um, I talked about how I marked it, but then I really only showed just a little bit of me trimming this out because I had already had these prepped. So right now what I'll tell you is um, there is no special prep that goes on the 12 wallpaper. You can trace your line and then base coat right on top of it. So um, sorry about that. 
thank you for keeping me straight, guys. If you see anything or you have any questions, please let me know. All right, this week we're going to um, be using just one single brush, and it is the Patty's Favorite Dry Brush brush. Let me get my messy table here. Okay, let's talk about the brush for a second because it really is um, different. Okay, so we have here is we have a filbert type brush that is cut like a filbert that way. And then it's cut to shaved point this way either side, okay? So what that means is when you put down the tip right there in the middle, only those middle bristles are touching. And what that's going to do for you is allow you to do like a scratchy kind of um, effect, like a dry brushing, where it looks like it's dry when you apply it. And when we have our rooster tail, we want that feathery, dry looking um, type of look. There are bristles that release and they fill in as I flick my finger across that. So what that means is, is that that's going to put some of the bristles down like if my hand is the bristles, my middle finger will hit first, and then the next fingers, and then the next fingers, making it a real gradual set down with a real gradual lift off. <clears throat> now one thing that does happen when we do dry brushing, um, we end up with a very dirty brush situation. We get a lot of um, gump messed up into, this is a, a new brush, but I've already got hardened paint in the bristles. So I'm going to grab my brush cleaner. All right, so I have the Winsor Newton Brush Cleaner and Restorer, and it is non-toxic, biodegradable, water-soluble, non-flammable, non-abrasive, low, low vapor. <clears throat> and I'm going to put a little bit of this out of my palette. You don't want to put this on a plastic palette or something that, um, that isn't um, reactionary. This will eat through um, like your plastic um, styrofoam-type palettes. <clears throat> okay, so as you can see, right away, now you saw that my brush was dry, um, and you can see right away it's already releasing the color that was in my brush, and this is a, a new brush, like I said, and I know I didn't put anything special in there, it's just the paint dries up there near the ferrule because you load it in there nice and glommy. Okay, so it will instantly start softening the paint that's in your brush in, in a non-toxic way. Okay, and you want to keep your brushes clean. If this brush gets too bushy, <clears throat> like this one, look and see. Whoops, look and see how fat that chisel is. I'm not going to get a very nice rooster tail. Okay, if I go into like this was a new brush, um, you can see. I mean, this has got a big wad. It's like pregnant or something. If I go into this brush and start cleaning this out, <clears throat> you'll see quite a bit of stuff come out of this one. Okay, so it instantly will clean out, and that means you're not going to be buying brushes after brushes after brushes because you're going to be keeping your brush in good condition by cleaning out the paint. Now what you can do, look at how much paint there is, it's crazy. Anyway, so once I have my brush restored, I'm just going to rinse it with soap and water. Now you never ever want to go back and forth when you're cleaning your bristles because that wears the tips. Okay, so you just want to go push, 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 flat, 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 and then flip it over, <clears throat> and then just keep working that. Okay, and for time purposes, I'm not going to keep at this. You can see the idea that, obviously, that releases the paint. All right, the colors that I have out are Burnt Umber. This is for the tail and the saddle feather sequence. I have Burnt Umber, Antique Maroon, Cocoa, Deep Burgundy, and um, Light Buttermilk. <clears throat> They're pretty straight conversions. The... Um, yeah, these ones, these are very straight conversions, actually. Um, I took all my jars out so I would remember their names. Put them back in. I want to talk about how we're going to load our brush. Okay, come down here. We're going to start, I put these out in a sequence, and dry brushing, this is kind of a dry brushing technique. It's not the dry rubbing, but the dry brushing. Um, <clears throat> when you're dry brushing, you have a sequence of colors. Um, if your background is black, then you want to start with your darkest color and move your way up. This is an accent color and so is this. It's like a highlight accent color, these two are. So we'll go from our darkest into this reddish kind of color, into the lighter, into an accent, into our, our final color. <clears throat> and what we'll do is we'll have our brush can be dry but pinched out. And we're going to load our brush on both sides. 
and then just kind of pull out, not big wads of paint, I'm not dipping in and pulling out a monster amount, pull out <clears throat> a flat amount of paint, get it pretty juicy. This one doesn't have to be quite as juicy because we're going to use the edge of our brush. Regular dry brushing though, you would get it very juicy over the top and then flat on the bottom. We'll be painting from the flat and from the chisel edge. So I'm back on top of my Lazy Susan. The nice thing, I'm um, as I'm sitting over here, you know, you think of things as you put your paints out and stuff. Um, this is keeping this off of my palette, and um, I can spin it around without it getting into my, my paint, which is kind of a nice little benefit. <clears throat> With the tail feathers, it's really very important that you keep everything going in a shape following kind of direction. <clears throat> if you pull tail feathers straight out, then you're going to have a chicken that looks very excited like he's been electrocuted. Okay, And if you pull out tail feathers in a little bit of a zigzaggy, then you're going to have a chicken that's going to have a little bit more of a maybe animated looking tail. If you pull out little lines of feathers, then you're going to have maybe a little bit more elegant type. Okay, If you bring out your tail feathers and you droop them down, then obviously, you know, you might have a sad chicken. Okay, so how we pull out the tail feathers is very important. Um, I've provided lines just as a placement guide. You don't have to exactly follow those lines. Now, the one thing I can't do is see my paint as I'm covering it up. So I'm going to get a little more paint now that I've rubbed it off. Okay, get it on there. I'm blending firmly and I'm making sure that I don't have a big wad of any kind of mess in my brush. <clears throat> I'm going to flick one time on my paper towel, just once, and a flat paper towel so that you don't wipe all the paint off. Okay, and we'll go in close, telephoto. If you like what you're seeing in this um, video sequence, this is how I shoot all of my, um, my DVDs. I shoot them all start to finish, working my way through the project, and that way you get to see everything that I do. And then I give you helpful hints and things like that um, along the way. And um, all of our DVD packets online come with the patterns in them. So when you're buying a DVD, you're getting the pattern as well. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do with the, ju ju pardon me, with the juicy part of our paint up. I need to find my glasses. All right, so with my juicy side of my paintbrush up, I'm going to start on a chisel of my brush, and I'm going to wipe my paint up. Okay, I'm a little flat, maybe a, I don't know what my angles are, um, maybe 20 or 30 percent kind of slope. And then I'm going to just kind of wipe that on. And if we get in really close, we'll be able to see. <clears throat> because it's so dark, tone on tone, what happens is you, um, you get kind of some freebies with this. So what happens see how we can see through here this is black this is brown this is black um, and what that means is it's not a solid application so when we want here comes our sample see what we want to see here is we want to see some of this um, striation kind of thing okay. so we're going to put on our first layer with the brown that'll cut the black and that'll give us a foundation for our other colors we're going to do shape following, follow the way that tail goes. <clears throat> Pardon me. So our brush is at an angle, and then we're going to turn our piece so that we can get a good angle on it. Okay, filling in that tail, reloading our brush when we don't have enough paint. Flick on the paper towel, don't just put it straight on there. Okay, fill it in. Now see, I'm dragging it skinny, then I'm kind of flat, and then I'm getting skinny again. So it's like a skinny, flat, skinny. Hopefully you saw some of that. Let's see. So, skinny, flattening out. Okay, we're going to continue down the tail. Shape following. If you get a flat spot, we're going to have other colors that go on top of this. So we're not going to care too much. The reason I'm doing the tail before I'm doing the saddle feathers is because 
um, the saddle feathers are going to come over some of these um, other feathers so I can actually start inside my saddle feathers. <clears throat> Drip that down. What we don't want to see is a line straight down the end of the tail that looks like somebody took scissors to them. So we need some of these to hang over and some of these to be shorter. Okay. Load your brush and see if you want to go for a little bit more fill in. Get a little distance between yourself. Don't don't sit right on top of your project. Get get up, stretch, come back to it, go load the dishwasher. You know, well, let's not get crazy. <laughs> okay. Sorry. That was almost like a blasphemy, wasn't it? Okay, so, um, but get up and, and, you know, go pour a glass of wine and, um, and get a little distance from your project, and that'll help you see better. I want a couple of loose feathers in the front of him. Okay, so now we're going to go, jump. yikes, sometimes on these little screens when it's in tight, I have a hard time finding myself. We're going to go dirty brush straight on into this um, candy bar conversion, which is the antique maroon. Okay, just dirty brush. Now what's going to happen then is you've got Papa Paint and Mama Paint and they're making a baby here, okay? <clears throat> That's all the time we have for the birds and bees this week. So what we have is we have Papa Paint, Mama Paint, and now because they're mixed together we have a nice baby paint. Flick on our paper towel. Get a good view, good angle. Okay, and now we're going to do some other strokes on here in another color. So that's going to be a little bit stronger colored, a little bit bolder, just because it's another layer. <clears throat> now this tail is kind of loose. We talked about this being a loose project at the beginning. That means that everybody's tail feathers are going to look a little bit different. When they're loose, that is you coming out of the brush. That means yours will not look just exactly like the next person's. I can't even paint like me on on some days. Okay, so we're liking that. You know, we like what we see. And we don't want to see a big gap in between here and this um, saddle feathers. Okay, then we're going to go into, I'm going to dry off my brush just a little bit. I'm going to wipe that paint, but not a lot. Oops, got you in close. And we're going to go over here into the next one. I wiped off a lot of that, um, just wiped it on the towel because too much of this dark with this light is going to make it too much of a mix. So we'll get that mixed into there. That's our new color, that tertiary second mix of a color. Now we're going to keep these highlights more to the top of the piece as accents. Look on my paper towel. Okay, we're making accents. The phone was ringing, so I had to stop. All right, so we'll go all the way. I'll go ahead and bring some of these down. Shape following. This is where things start showing, so if you haven't got the idea of not base coating with this um, technique, you might want to practice a little bit more before you get to this point. Tell you what, this um, artist buddy is about a dream. It just really, you know, it's just so easy to move things around. We do need to kiss the, the whole tail with this um, colors. We don't want to have them isolated. If you have just a few colors up here on the top of your tail and then you don't have them someplace else, then they're going to look really lonely. So we need to keep things uniform. Now on the other hand, if we start highlighting, we don't want the highlight to be everywhere because then it won't make anything special. The definition of highlighting something would be to make it stand out. So um, when we get ready to highlight, we'll have a kiss of things here and there, but we won't have as much of, a, as much of it in the piece. Okay, so I'm going to go one more time with this color. <clears throat> kind of reaching for highlights there at this point. Okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to wipe my brush out and I'm going to pick up some of that red which is the deep burgundy and that's the maroon conversion. And we're going to add some accents of red in our tail. It starts getting a little bit redder. Okay. And 
there's Ace the Wonder Dog helping us out. There's my husband yelling at Ace the Wonder Dog. I'm going to wash my brush now. <clears throat> wash it. And there's a lot of paint up in there. This is one of those times when you would definitely want to use the brush cleaner after you get done with your project. Now I'm not going to go to my final highlight yet because on the final highlights they have um, we want to do that once we get some balance with our our um, saddle feathers. Okay, and the reason those are called saddle feathers is because that looks like a saddle. So we'll go back to that same technique, load our brush, load the load, load the load, load with the brown, and we're going to go to the saddle feathers and do the same exact thing, but we have a little bit of a twist with where we start. Okay, so I'm loading, loading. Love the idea of video with these, um, with this, because in a class you can see you can see the teacher doing things, but you really can't get a good feeling for um, the exact brush stroke and where things start because you just can't see your hands. So video is in some ways really a nice thing. Okay, so I'm telephoto in. Okay, and I don't have very much paint in my brush. I think I need a little bit more. And that's when you don't want to pull in like a big mountain of paint just because you're in a hurry. I always tend to be in a rush. Okay, so now this, <clears throat> you're going to start everything from this line up here. Okay, that's that's the line. And then when you get there, you're going to bring it right on down. Reload your brush as needed. And you'll turn your brush. In order to get these nice, pretty, chisel-shaped feathers, you're going to need to turn your brush to finish the stroke. Okay, and there's Jenny, the cute little puppy. We haven't gotten a good picture up online yet of her. She's a sweet puppy. She's actually the same age as Ace, but she's docile and doesn't boss us around like Ace does. Ace is definitely very bossy. Okay, so flipping that over. And so I'm ending on the chisel. Okay. Over the top. <clears throat> okay, now we'll go into the next color, dirty brush. That's our antique maroon. And these are gonna stop at the the golden brown stage and not get too light, but and we still have room to do some stuff here. Okay, pull it down. These just hang at the side and they make like a little saddle over his back. Okay, you can go back. Say I think that those feathers are, notice that I'm not worrying about where they end according to these lines. I'm just going with what's comfortable with my hand today. <clears throat> say I look at the saddle feathers and say I think that they might be just a little bit um, bulkier looking than my tail feathers. Well, what you can do is you can go right back up here and just bulk that up. If you want to make them wider, you can make them wider. So you have the ability to kind of go back and forth over these until you like what you see. <clears throat> I'm going to wipe off my brush, and then I'm going to load in the cocoa, which is the conversion for, I don't know what, um, spice tan. Load in the cocoa that's going to mix and make another color right there. Okay. Give it... Okay, so we're going to give this, this one I want to go just a little bit more wide. Oops. Now see, when we do something like that, it's kind of flat looking. Get out your ding-dang eraser. Now you want to be careful because everything's wet. So I've got my little um, wave eraser. <clears throat> I'm going to dip it at the end in water so it's wet. And I want to go over here and just gently erase that end off of there. Blot it, wipe it off with my paper towel, and my mistake is fixed, and I don't have to panic. 
I go. Now I kind of have to let that get dry a little bit. Okay, so here we go. That's a little better. That drag and drop. You really want this one scratchy. Don't forget your fingers are mops. We've all been equipped with mop brushes called fingers. <clears throat> Okay, and maybe I want to go back into my my tail feathers and give them a little bit more up on top. Okay, so they're more of the star, and I'm going to leave it a little bit darker down in this area right here. I'm going to go into my red dirty brush, flick it on a paper towel. Out here, same kind of thing. Now I'm just accenting, noticing I'm not spending so much time in there. <clears throat> I'm going to go dirty brush into the. Um, no, we can't go dirty brush from the red to the light buttermilk because what we're making is pink. And we do not want a pink tail. So, I have to get out of that, wash our brush out, pinch all the water out. Pinching, pinching. Okay, so I'm going to go into. I'm going to go into the yellow color, load that in my brush, and then I'm going to go into just a little bit of that light buttermilk. Flick on my favorite towel. And this is going to make things kind of get a little bit chalky. And what we're going to do is after we get them chalky, then we're going to glaze a little bit. Okay. Flipped. This needs to be gentle. You're not going to put screaming amounts of color on here. Okay, so we're going to accent. If I had any paint in my brush, we'd accent. Alright, so we have our tail and it's dry. Now what I would do at this point is to take my eraser and go ahead and erase all those extra little lines. If you are a painter who bases coats in a hurry, like I don't know, maybe somebody else I know, um, who shall be nameless, um, and then you hurry to get your lines transferred on, you will find that your lines are always getting trapped inside your paint. And the reason for that is, is you haven't allowed your paint to cure before, um, before putting it on. So it's actually capturing your graphite lines. So, there we go, we got our stuff. Now what I'm seeing right here is I'm seeing a big space. So we need to go back in and fix that. Those feathers will be just a little bit shorter than the rest of the saddle feathers and they're going to droop right over that wing a little bit. So we'll just go back to the beginning of where we... Notice that I'm turning my piece quite a bit because I cannot possibly start here and then flip that the way I need to. Go into dirty brush into the next color up. And take maroon. And then into the cocoa. Looking on my paintbrush. Looking on my paper towel. Okay, now those are draped over. That's making me a little bit happier. We're gonna have um, neck feathers up here as well. So, what we can do now, if we would like to, and now I'm seeing in my piece quite a bit of a yellow color, which I do not have listed on my palette. It is pretty bright yellow. Um, I'm going to look in my book of colors, and I'm going to find a yellow that I like. What happens sometimes is when I go and teach, I see yellow in a couple spots, actually. When I go to teach, somebody might have a color out, and I might reach into it, and I might accent something or something like that, but I see some kisses of the yellow in these places. Um, and so I'll find that yellow and we'll add it to our palette. Okay, I got out cadmium yellow. They make a cadmium yellow or a bright yellow, um, pretty bright, darn yellow, in every line of paint. So any kind of conversion to that would be fine. What I want to do now is go ahead and just wash a mix of my antique maroon 
and my cocoa. And a wash is going to be this brush mixing here and just making a wash 80% water 20% paint okay just to get kind of a middle color there blot on my paper towel till the shine goes away and I'm gonna go ahead and wash in a couple places over my tail including where that was real bright and that should tone things down just a little bit and it should perk up the tail now I'm gonna pick up my yellow on my brush Click it on my paper towel, and then we'll give these accents of yellow up in that tail. Keep it off of the black because yellow and black make green. I didn't know if you knew that, but yellow and black do definitely make green. They make a pretty nice um, camouflage kind of color green, but we don't want a sickly looking chicken. Oops. So when we do that, brush it right back off and our mistake is fixed. You know, teachers make mistakes just every bit, probably more often than our students do. And the difference is just being brave enough and bold enough to fix them. I'm going to go ahead and give him a few accents over the back of his saddle feathers there. I'm liking how that's looking. Now, am I liking, let's assess this for a second. Am I liking this contrast into the wing, the tail feathers, as a body together. If I squint at this piece, what I'm going to see is I'm seeing that this is a big black hole and it's not very interesting to see. Okay, so I'm thinking that I probably need to move up my colors um, in that area and so I'm going to use the colors on my palette right now, mix into some brown, dirty brush, and pick up some of the antique maroon. And get the right angle. We're just going to go up here and just increase to a lighter color wing feather. And maybe we'll get a little bit of that cocoa going on the, um, on the edge. Okay, now we're suddenly seeing that it's a little bit more family. They, have, they belong together just a little bit more. But maybe now my tail, my tail feathers aren't looking like they're um, bright enough or bold enough. A lot of this I do at the end, but I want to go ahead with some cocoa and increase the strength. <clears throat> I'm glad I filmed this today because by tomorrow I may not have a voice. Okay, we're going to increase the strength of those accents. Same thing over here. Now it's looking a lot more like things belong together. I want to go ahead and do our geraniums loosely. We call these geraniums. Um, we're going to get our um, black forest green and we're going to pick it up with our same brush. I'm going to add a little bit of water to it, it'll be easier, like maybe just a touch of water to it, just so it gets a little runny lot on my paper towel. And then I'm going to scumble. Um, this is just absolutely loose, scumbly looking. We'll make it so it doesn't get green on his chest there. Every time I pick up the color, I'm going to want to blot my brush. Okay, if it's too washy, then you'll end up not being able to see any green. You'll have to go back and do it again. Okay, so we're just scumbling on, leaving some spaces, not leaving some spaces. We can have this spill over onto our border just a little bit. There'll be a border around there with the red. Okay, fill that in. It's not a solid thing. I think you can see where the reflections are, that it's not solid. Okay, so we need an eraser lines. Don't erase his legs unless you feel like you can wing it. Ha 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 ha. Pun intended. Okay. So then we're going to go in with a little bit of washy middle, middle green and that is 
Hauser medium. I want Hauser light out as well. I'm going to mix a little bit of the dark green. This is where I talked about because I'm on a middle color, middle value palette paper. Okay, I've got my dark on here, and I saw how that set on there. Well, guess what? Value-wise, we're still probably at a 9. Value-wise over here, I'm pull out my value finder. We are probably at like a 6. Okay, so if we're talking about a rule of 2, we go from black and our value 1, and then we go to a 6, then obviously we are making a leap of gigantic proportions. Okay, so if we're doing a rule of 2, we need to cut that. Okay, if we want to make that leap just a little bit less, um, then we need to cut that. If I was on my white paper, I might not notice that this value is so much lighter than that is. That'll look very dark, but this will look fairly dark on a light piece of paper. So this is where having our gray palette paper is going to help us. <clears throat> it's not a splendiferous um, example, but it is a good example of why, why we like the toned paper. Okay, so we're going to go ahead, put a little water in our mi brush mix. <clears throat> and we want to look for this to be sitting down on here nicely. Okay, we're just scumbling in some clusters of shrubbery, kind of. You know, the leaves on geraniums are kind of roundish. I'm sneaking up on this. I don't need to get there all at one time. Don't want them to look like pokey dots. Okay, just sneak up on it, and we can do it again. So, now we get that. And I'm looking at my monitor right now, looking for a little bit of balance as far as we need to be over next to his chest, so that it's not just a hole. Now I'm going to put more of the other color in my brush, more of the, um, the middle green, what was it called, Hauser medium green, and I'm going to scumble within my scumbles. And I'm not going to do every one now. I'm going to do some. And we want these to be irregular, rounded shapes. Um, if, if you do too much with just, um, like, round, it'll look polka dotted. <clears throat> that would be bad. Pardon the throat clearing. So we were talking before our UPS man, who is wonderful because he brought us our new pellets. Um, we were talking that um, the sound... Um, so there's the sound down in the icon on the lower right in your, I think it was a, like your systems tray that monitor, that adjusts the <clears throat> volume level for the whole computer. Then there's the sound on your speakers. Don't forget that you can turn sound up on your speakers. And then there's also the sound on, um, on the Viddler screen itself. There's a bar at the bottom that you can slide back and forth. So try a couple of those things, and if it fixes it, let me know so that we know that we're not having a technological difficulty. Um, if everybody was complaining, I'd be a little more worried. Okay, now we want to do, we want to let this fade over here and fade up here. So we want to give a few more. I'm going to go into that brighter green that wasn't really showing. A few more brighter moments just right up here. <clears throat> I see I have what looks like dice right there. I'm going to back up to my darker mix and I'm going to cut that just a little bit so it doesn't look so much like dice. Okay, I'm liking that so I'm going to stop. <clears throat> my flowers are fluffed in with maroon and Moroccan red. Maroon is our deep burgundy which we already had out and Moroccan red is very red plus burgundy wine. Okay, so we've got our colors out. I'm going to take just a little bit of our berry red and I'm going to mix a little bit of our burgundy wine together. That's going to tone that red down because that is a screaming fire engine red. So this has got a little bit of a blue red, pink kind of color to it. And with our screaming red, that's going to make it nice and mellow. So I've got a little brush mix, but what we have to do first is just like with the leaves, we have to start with our darker color. <clears throat> so we'll take our whatever color this is, deep burgundy. Okay, and we'll load it in our brush. We're not going to add water to this, I don't think. We might need to, but we'll see. Okay, and now we're going to make our geraniums, and they're just going to be loosely fluffed clusters, irregular, 
that clustered. Now some of you are going to want to do a lot more details on this and make you know geranium petals and and that kind of thing and that is wonderful. I, I see no problem with you changing. You can make blue geraniums if you want to. Um, you know whatever floats your boat. It is your project. It is your creation. Just because we're painting from a line or painting you know, another person's design does not mean that we can't use our own creativity and express ourselves. This would not be any fun at all if we didn't have any um, expression to it. So please, 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 please always feel free to express yourself with my, my patterns and designs, and I hope that you do. Okay, we're going to go into that lighter mix. Might have to mix some more. I'm dirty brushing. Now I'm going to go right on top of that and just give it that little bit of bright highlight kind of thing, just fluffing it on, keeping the bright highlights towards the front. This is going to be more of our focal point. We can kiss all of them except the very edge flowers. <clears throat> we'll let those fade out. Now I'm going to go into straight um, bright red, which is which berry red, and we're going to give those just a little pat in the highlight areas. Okay, see how that's sticking out nicely? I think we could still use a little bit more brightness to it, so I'm going to go into my green. I'm actually going to go, I think I'm going to do a green but not be quite so. I'm going to go into my light green and then go into my yellow here and make a yellow bright green. So it's toned a little bit with colors from the rooster. Oops. And does that seem like it's screaming? Wow. Okay. Lick my finger. Take it off. Put a little bit of the medium color in there, the medium green color. Okay, so I'm just going to blend in. Just a little bit of light highlights. Okay, stumble, stumble. Okay, awesome. Okay, I think I'm real happy with that. Let's add some chickens for our legs to start bird to stand on and just keeping him with this brush we've used one brush I'm using the number eight by the way even on this small size project um, I have a fairly light touch <clears throat> let's go into burnt umber and a little bit of our cocoa color and make just kind of a brown mix and use the chisel of our brush and give him a couple legs to stand on there we go I like it I think while I have this in my hand I think I'll get some of that cocoa color and increase my highlights up through here. I think I need to do that. Now that I know where I'm kind of going, I can start playing as I've got my colors out. Okay, well, we're going to take our compass, our homework assignment. We're going to keep that right on that edge. Nice thing about the Lazy Susan is you can Turn it with one hand while you're holding the compass on the edge with the other. You've got to go slow because the edge, if it slips or your hand tips, then you're not going to have a good, um, good line there. Okay, put the compass away. That's that half pipe compass, <clears throat> in case you were wondering. Okay, so I've got. I'm going to work with small pieces of tape. I don't want to use big pieces of tape. I've got to get my light on so that I can see. I tell you what, it makes a big difference. You get in here with all these lines, the toile, and it's like, gosh, you can't see anything. I always bend my tape out on one side. Now you're going to pull it. Let me show you off camera here um, on something else. There we go. All right, get them close. Actually, I think I want to use this palette paper because it's got a little bit of stick to it. As you, you start off with your tail tucked, that way, um, as you're going around, you can meet that other line when you when you complete your circle. But as you go, you pull, and I'm, I'm gripping it in one hand. And I'm pulling it in the other, and it will pull into a nice, perfect circle. Okay, and the reason that you use 
the shorter strips is so that you can come back just a little bit, readjust it, and fix your circle. You'll pat it down nice and firm, bray it with your fingernail, and you'll do both sides of your line. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do on the clock. You can see how much light that's giving me. And I love the green. I'm a green machine. I love green. <clears throat> the door of my studio is green, too. Of course, I've got pink glasses that I'm putting on my face right now, so I guess I like pink, too. Okay, so in light of not wanting to use too skinny a tape, um, I moved up to my quarter inch tape and the wider, which is dip more difficult to do a tight turn, which would be the inside turn, I'm using on this wider edge. So, what I'm going to do, I wanted to show this, let me get close up in, I've added a music remote so that I can play music in between taping and um, if you get music every now and again, sorry about that, I'm picking up the wrong remotes. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to go a little bit slower and pull pretty pretty hard and then just inch it on there and press it down as you go. And it does turn. Now I'm not worrying about this back side. See how that's kind of buckled over there. As long as I'm stuck on this side, I'm happy. And so you just pull it in tight. Okay. And see, that looks like it, it moved in a little bit on me. I'm going to ignore my line and swing it out just a little bit. I think I must have wonkied my compass. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. You're just going to do this whole thing. Then, when I'm stippling on here, what I'll do with my sponge, get the sponge out. So we're going to tap in to our paint, tap, 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 tap. It doesn't soak it up like um, like a cell sponge does, the kind in the kitchen sink. This is a dense um, type sponge, okay? And then you're going to, with care, to keep it on there, keep it off of the twill, bounce it on there, centering it. The nice thing about tapping on your color is it doesn't bleed under the tape. So whenever you have a line that you want to not have a bleed under, then you tape it. You can use scotch tape. You can't use scotch tape in the round, but you can use scotch tape just to do a border. And then you can do um, um, dum dum. And you tap on your paint. By the time I get around to the other side, it's going to be all dry. I'm going to do mine and then, you know, not bore you to tears here. Okay, as I go around the other side, and now it's dry, I'm going to add, I'm going to not tap so much with my paint, and I'm going to lay it on there so that it covers. This deep burgundy color that we're using is very, very transparent. Um, so I am going to lay it on. Now that the other color is on there and it's kind of sealed any kinds of places where it could paint can sneak under, I can go heavy with this. This is where our artist buddy is coming in real handy. I don't have to shift. I'm not over handling that border. One of the nice things about the artist buddy is its adjustment, um, its height adjustment. A lot of us lay our projects on the flat of our painting table and then we, you know, look at your own posture right now if you're painting and um, ask yourself, you know, is that good for my posture? Is that good for my back? If I was doing this and I was alone and not on camera, I would simply take my adjustment, probably up to the highest one, okay, and I would get it up there and I would lay this on here like this and then I can just rotate it around and I'm sitting straight up. I mean the posture difference is immediate. You can tell. If you have back problems or shoulder problems, um, this is the tool for you. This just It's like an extra pair of hands too because I'm not having to, see Ma, no hands. I'm not having to hold this um, on here. I can use my hand to stabilize if I want to. You know, I don't have to hold this piece. And with the little locking wedge, goes under there somewhere. Um, I can lock it into place and so now it won't move. Okay, and just pull the, pull the plug 
and it'll, you know, it just stays on there. I mean, isn't that crazy? Okay, this is DecoArt's Hot Shots, and this is Sizzling Pink, okay, and it talks about, okay, well, it doesn't really talk about anything, so we're going to take some of this out, and we are going to get our brush out of the water, pinch out all the water. It's a kind of transparent medium. Pick up some of our sizzling pink. And just run that up the middle. Okay, so that is brighter. I think I'm, I'm liking that, so we can call that a good thing. Now I'm Martha Stewart, okay. So yeah, don't don't do it everywhere, but don't make spots and checks and things like that. Okay, just up the middle. And it'll settle down. When you put it on here, it settles into the darker color. Pardon my snotty nose. I've had a cold. Not a bad one, just one that's irritating. Okay. Now I'll get rid of the brush and start peeling. When you peel tape, there's actually a way to peel tape. You peel it down, like see how I'm folding it straight down. Let me get telephoto zoom. Okay, instead of lifting it up and pulling it that way, you actually pull it down and away. And I'm flat on my piece, okay? It doesn't have to quite touch, but this is going to cut the edge of the tape. What happens sometimes when you pull up like this, you will yank up the tape, the paint that's on there. This pulls it away from the edge of the paint, making it a very clean, sharp edge. And because I'm right on top of my piece here, I can actually see where it's lifting just a little bit as I'm pulling it away because I did it pretty thick. Now, right here, I've got a little white spot. I need to put a little black there. That's where my black line wasn't so perfect. Take that hair out of there. Anyway, but see how nice and clean and sharp, whoops, see how nice and clean and sharp that line is? So I'd like to talk about these little lights. Um, I've got to say, I am so impressed. Um, it is a truly flexible, look at the difference between over here and over here. Look at how much light is actually shining on that. You can get it far away, and you can get it up tight and close, however much light you need. It's got two buttons on it, or two lamp on it, and you can turn on one or turn on both. Okay, it clips, it's got a little foam thing on the bottom so it won't damage things. It clips onto your piece, and it also stands. It's a freestanding light. Um, these lights are not, um, they're not just for painters. This is a light that you could use for stamp collecting. You can use it for your crafting. I've got one clipped on the back of my where my computer is so I can see where the ports are. And I just left it there um, because I'm always getting in and out of the back of my computer. Um, it, you know, it, it doubles as a flashlight and it's because it's got this long head in, that you can straighten out. You can tuck it into a cupboard to see where you're going, you know, and you can use it in your car, you can use it working on cars. This is, this is not just for painters, this is for everybody. It, um, the heads, they say that the heads never, the lamps, I'll show you the side view, they're kind of domed so that it doesn't spotlight things in, you know, like a hot spot in the light. It actually does an evenly cascading light, and there's two of them. And um, they say that you'll never need to replace those bulbs, okay? And then there's a place for batteries in the bottom, and I think they're triple A's. And there's also a place where you can plug in, um, plug your lamp in, so that that way you're not wasting batteries if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but the fact that it's freestanding, the fact that you can clip it on, the fact that it's small enough to go in your painting bag, it weighs, you know, nothing, and it is entirely flexible. So um, I'm, I'm a fan. And I did want to say, I tested another one. I've been looking for a light that we can, um, that we can use as painters when we're in those dark classrooms so we can spotlight our light, you know, our particular spot. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, and then if you're turning your piece, you know, if you, if you want this tail, if you want to see all the details here, you can just move the lamp, you know. It sits right on your piece, and it's, it's not wiggly. It's got little, um, it, it doesn't wiggle around. 
It doesn't have any feet. I thought it had feet. It's so stuck, I thought it had feet. Okay, we'll get it there. And you can move this, you know, so it's at an angle. Paint right there, move it to the other side. You know, whatever you want. Clip it to your piece. Clip it to your apron and have it go down, shine down on whatever you're working on. You know, knitting cross-stitch, you know, reading those cross-stitch patterns that make my eyes go cross. Um, anyway, that's my little shameless advertising plug for this. I think it's one uh, product that we all need in our painting kit or just even in our book bag where we want to have a spotlight for reading in bed or whatever. All right, so before we get ready to do that, I have to show you a new thing I found. It is carried at Joanne Fabrics. And it is a slim scrapbook case um, by the company um, Just Wear. Anyway, it was in the scrapbooking section. And this is so cool. Let me show you. Okay, if you open this up, it's got little clips right here. It was, I think it was $6, $6.99. All right, if you open this up, it folds all the way out. It has a little clippy thing here to keep your whatever in place. But look at what happens. Your palette fits perfectly inside this. And there's room up here if you had, um, let's see, a lot of you use milk bottle caps or water bottle caps for your mediums if you need mediums. You put your little medium bottles and stuff like that out here. Then when you leave, you know, you're getting ready to leave your palette. Let's see, where is my misting bottle? Ah, my misting bottle is missing. Oh, it's my favorite. Oh, no. Okay, I'll find it. It's probably in my portable bag. Anyway, you... Ch -ch 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 -ch. This is my pretend mister. You missed your products. The phone rang. You got to go pick up the kids from school. Just close that. Put it away. And now your paints are going to be fresh for you to come back to later. Okay? And you probably can even put... Make room for your... Um, you know, make a little wet palette space up here, fold a paper towel. Let me show you how to make a mini wet palette. You're in painting class and you made a mix of some paint and geez louise, you don't want to have to make it again because I know how much we love to make paint. So I folded my paper towel up, I dipped it in water, kind of squoze it out dry, and now I can put that up there. Oops, and <laughs> knock that down. And then I can put my paints right on top of this wet paper towel. A little bit will soak in, but not very much. And the idea of having a wet paper towel within your palette when this is closed will keep everything fresh. So you can come back to it a little bit later and you'll still have some fresh paints and things like that. Isn't that sweet? I thought that was kind of clever. Oh, and I've got one more thing to show you. Hang on a second. Let me grab a tool. All right, I learned this from the Australians that took a class with Josonia this last year. Okay, they had a different version of this, but I didn't know where to find them, so I finally found this one, which I love the fact that it's totally flexible. You pull this out, and you can fold it around, and it's going to hold its shape. But what you can do with this, because this lid, you saw me go bang with it. Say you're at class, and maybe you want to bring this as a portable, um, carry it with you, um, paint carrier, okay, so palette carrier, if you will, then what you can do is you can clip one end of this, so you don't want this to go bang and hit somebody else, so what you can do is take this and you can make it into a little prop, okay, the neat thing about this is now you've got your own little contained space, what's to stop you from clipping, you know, maybe pictures here at the you can see my hands clipping pictures up here at the top or, or something like that. If you wanted to clip it straight up and down, I love tools, can you tell? Clip it like this, okay. Now, whoops, <laughs> oh, I guess we've got to keep a little lean on it, sorry. But now what I could do is I could take a piece of scotch tape and I can take my directions there. And then, presto changeo, I have a palette keeper with directions with um, that's held up. And if I wanted to add one more little tool, I can add my picture holder. And I can clip it on there. And then I can get my pictures, which turn and rotate all over the place, in there as well. Each one of these rotates. So... I can have a little surrounding portable studio and 
and it all closes up. You want to make sure that your picture comes out of there, your instructions come out of there when you're getting ready to um, close it, because obviously it's going to get all yucky. But um, isn't that handy? And it marks your space. I mean, it's just, it's just clever. I love it. We're going to load into Coco, okay, just like kind of normal. Um, we've got a little area to do, so I'm going to load both sides just flat loaded. I'm going to, I want a chiseler, a chiseler, hmm, a chiseler edge on my brush. So I want it nice and skinny because I'm going to have to tip it sideways. If I used this brush flat on this um, area of his little self, then um, I would just be base coating him and going way out of the line. So I don't want to do that. I'm going to zoom you in. Okay, so what we're going to do is use the chisel edge of our brush. So this is another time when our um, Lazy Susan comes in pretty darn handy because you really need, as you come down over, hang on, let's get a tool. Tools are good. This is the yellow marker, the yellow monster marking tool. And what it does is it does very fine lines in a light color. So on everything except for, and it even shows on white, um, because it is darker than white. Maybe on this middle background it would be difficult to see, so you wouldn't want to do it there. But it erases with yerk, erases with water, or erases with your pencil. So it's not going to stay stuck on there. It also erases with saliva, because that's what I just used. Sorry. Okay, so on this, what we need to do is we need to pretend like each one of these things is an arrow. Okay, we need shape following which means we follow the arrows. Okay, each of these lines is an, whoops, I'm so off camera. Okay, each of these lines is an arrow for shape following this. Okay, get you on there. It's because I have this on this lazy Susan, I can't keep it in the middle because it's off to the side, sorry about that. All right, what would happen if you made, you know, all of the lines go straight down? See, I, the nice thing about this I can draw right on top of this, and I know that I can just wipe it right back off. It makes sketching eyes and details on your project. I use it on my lace ornaments. Um, it's yellow, and it has yellow leads and yellow refills. It's on the website. Anyway, so what happens if I go straight up and then straight down? You can kind of see I'm going to have, God, I'm a crazy chicken. Okay, so shape following is super de duper important. Um, Got to follow those lines. Um, otherwise you're going to have, you know, a freakish looking chicken that looks like he's part of the punk rock band or something like that. Okay, pinching out my brush because I plopped it in the water. You know, the water is a good place for your brush when you are, um, you know, waiting to do something. Let's get you on camera. Now I'm going to need to turn my piece. Let me pause for a second. I want to get these um, extra lines over there so I don't confuse you. So I'm just using a Q-tip to erase these lines and just pulling them back off so that, you know, it's, they're not sitting there making extra lines for you so you don't have a problem following along. But see how that just took those right off? Okay, so it, that is one of the, the handiest tools to have in your toolbox is a marking utensil. The soapstones are great, but they're not very sharp and so they're not very accurate. Um, accuracy is going to clean up your painting more than I can even, you know, suggest. Okay, so let's go into here more than I can even suggest. How's that for a recommendation? All right, go into the cocoa paint, flat on either side, flick it once on your paper towel, and now in our shape following way, we're going to just flick. I'm not going to worry about the eye and things like that. We're going to flick and make a foundation of cocoa feathers coming out of the eye area okay leaving black in between let me get in closer okay and then we will erase the lines that we have on here um, as soon as we get the first coat on this is going to establish our um, <laughs> I keep doing that I'm so sorry I'm going to establish these lines now on this back one I want these feathers to kind of pull out of this area. So I'm making a bunch of little sharp ones. And then I'm going to come back on, reload some paint, and I'm going to come back on 
and make it a little bit long for the other feathers. You gotta have enough paint in your brush. You know, if your brush, look at what that did. That's just like, um, hello, there's nothing there. So if, you know, you're getting that, then stop and load some more paint. Sometimes we get so frustrated and it's just silly stuff like loading paint. Okay, so I don't care if I'm dragging through my comb the, or the waddle. And actually, I need to go up to it. So we need to leave some space around it, but we need to go to it. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of... Um, a lot of black around it or not enough black. Okay, so come down. Remember we're making chicken feathers and not um, long hair, so we don't want curly hairs like on a little girl project or something. Okay, get some color back there. Get you on camera. Now this is gonna be one of those things, like you guys are just getting ready to watch and the project spins away. Sorry about that. This is going to be where we would flip it over and come at it from the other direction so we can have a few of these feathers sticking out the front. Okay, so we get that. Now we've got to pull this over. Notice how there's these black lines and stuff right there. That's going to be seemingly unattractive, so we kind of have to cover that black up because that is going to look like we cut a hole where our chicken, you know, where we cut him out and pasted him. Okay, so now we've kind of got that covered up. I want to make sure that it is covered up and go over that lower area. Okay, maybe he needs to have a little bit bigger splotch of color. Okay, I'm widening out. Notice I'm not pressing really hard when I do this. Okay, so now he's having a bad hair day. But what we're going to do is we're going to repeat, just by my directions, and if I could find my directions, um, spice tan and spice tan again with a touch of brune. I don't think I'm ready for that. And spice tan is the delta color, not, um, not this color. This is cocoa. Okay, so I'm going to do it again. I'm going to get a couple of the hairs up here by his eye. Now that I know where I'm going, oh, I said I was going to erase that stuff, huh? Okay, so get in there and make sure my lines are erased so I don't sink them into the stuff forever. Okay, and now... I'm going to fill them in just a little bit more. Totally off camera, good job. We're gonna fill them in just a little bit more. Stronger colors. Okay, and I think he's looking pretty good. Now we're gonna go into a little bit of candy bar. Is that the color? Let's see. No, it's plus maroon, so that's gonna be the, uh, the deep burgundy. Okay, pour that out. Get a little bit of the deep burgundy with our cocoa. It's going to make it tinted a little bit. Okay, not everywhere. Just fill in with some layers of some colors. deepen his colors up. Now this would be a good time, if you wanted to, to come in here. Now we're seeing that. What are we seeing? We're seeing a chicken. Okay. Now we're still seeing that maybe this is getting brighter. This is still kind of taken over, and then this is um, not quite maybe bright enough. So I'm going to pick up a little bit of that color and go back into my tail feathers. I'm going to come down into the wing and I'm just going to start popping some things around. Okay, maybe we want to have these kind of blend. Okay. There we go. And now we get a little bit of ivory out, which is empty. If you flip your paints upside down when they're getting kind of empty, then they, you can get all the goods out of there. I'm just dirty brushing, dirty brush loading this into the ivory flick on my paper towel. 
Now we're going to make some little accents. You should start seeing some things kind of pop here. Just with the chisel edge. This isn't so base coaty, this is accents. Okay, just a couple of hairs. Got a loose hair over here. Okay, all right, now that's really kind of taken over, right? Now it's bright. So now we want to come leading edge into our wings down here. Mm, not too big a jump. I'm going to give a couple of crazy hairs up here. Okay, now see how we're balancing things out. This, is, this should be done at the end of every project. You should always go balance things out. Shape following strokes, don't forget. Okay. Now I want to pick up some of that yellow that we got out the other day, the CAD yellow. Pick it up, dirty brush. And let's work a little bit of that into our neck feathers. Just streaks like the little chickens have been out in the sunshine. And now let's go ahead and give some of that to our tail feathers. Kind of some strong. Strong accents. Okay, I like it now that's gone. Maybe a little down here. Inside our brush, we're going to go to the beak and the waddle. Alright, here we go. We are using um, antique maroon and we are going to load like we did with the dry brush earlier. Get kind of juicy. Flick on your paper towel. And it's shape following strokes again. It's always shape following strokes. And I'm going to start strong at the end with my brush and bend it so that it comes in the way I want it to. And we have to leave a little bit of space between his um, comb and his feathers right there. Otherwise, if you don't leave a little bit of space, it won't look shadowed. And that's the whole idea with dry brushing is that it looks shadowed. And there's a video online called How to Dry Brush that really gets into the nuts and bolts of this. Now, I'm also going to leave a space on that side of the piece. My snuffling. And that is going to be so that I don't have to shade. No floating. Okay, look at this guy. I'm turning my brush on the chisel as I need to. Okay, this isn't a base coat. This is just really a couple flicks. Base coating would be a much stronger color. Now, I'm going to have to turn my piece over and move my chicken. I'm going to do the bottom one first. Whatever's on top, this is on top then this is the one that I would leave some black showing around it so that it looks like this is causing a shadow on top of this one. So I'll start here. <clears throat> I think I have a combination of allergies and a cold, which just is a joy. Okay. And then this one will go all the way to the edge. Okay. And let's cut it back just a little bit. Now the eye is special. I'm going to switch to a little round brush. Um, I'm going to load it like a dry brush. And then let's get you in close. The eye causes everybody great big grief. Let's see if a little bit of close up can't help you out. Okay. Notice with the eye that there are, that's an oval shape or a football type shape. And then the inside shape is also an oval type shape. Well what we're going to do is we're going to use our round brush and we're going to paint just a little bit of paint on either side of the oval, leaving a black hole in the middle. Okay, reload my brush. And then a little, using the chisel of my brush, a little oval within that oval. Okay, and we'll leave black on either side. Maybe I'll close that up just a little bit around the back side. Okay, so that's what you do. You just do the oval within the oval and you should be good. Now our beak is raw sienna. My thumb is getting sore. Time to switch to the to my painter's thumb. And I always think I can, you know, outsmart the bottle, and I never can. So I'm gonna dry brush into my raw sienna. 
and just chisel in his beak. All right, I'm going to pick up um, a little bit of this raw sienna, and I'm going to use that in my chrome and wattle. Now notice that I'm just using, oops, let's get you closer in. Notice that I'm just going to use just a little hint of this here, a little bit of that there. This is the way to paint. Don't be all stuck in a rut with the, you know, what did the teacher do exactly? Okay, I don't like that, so. There's a little perfect moth there. You know, do what your piece needs. You know, let's, let's be thinking about our own piece. We don't have to match our neighbors. What if she has a really heavy hand? And even though it's beautiful, what if you're never going to have a heavy hand? I'm going to pick up a little bit more yellow. And while I'm in this yellow, let's go ahead and accent his beak. I've only got one coat of things. And let's give a little bit more of this yellow into his feathers up here. Now this yellow, remember yellow on top of black is going to make um, green. So we want to make sure that we're not on top of our black with our yellow. Okay, see, so now the tail is starting to perk up a little bit. Things, ah, uh, yeah, they're starting to go together. I still think this is a little too dark, so I'm going to go into the candy bar conversion with a little bit of raw sienna. I'm going to just tickle in, almost like makeup. I want to tone that dark down. Okay, now that's better. Yeah, that doesn't look black anymore. It's okay to have it be a little bit dark, but oof, it was looking little too dark. Now how about some raw sienna and a little bit of the yellow mix and let's bring it down on his breast of his uh, breast and thigh. And that lightened him up a little bit there. And I think we could even swing some raw sienna out the back here. Just a little bit more. Alright. He's one handsome little rooster. Okay, and somebody else told me that you have to have a sparkle in the eye because living things have a sparkle in the eye. So I'm going to use a liner. We don't want a dead chicken on our hands here. Use a liner. And we're just going to go into the very middle of his eye and just give him a little eyeball. And actually, I really hate that. So I'm going to lick my mop, take that off, go into black. my black back. I'm going to put a bigger dot of black. And then a microscopic dot of highlight. That's the hard part is getting a microscopic. And, whoops, there we go. Okay, now he's got that highlight. You could highlight if you wanted to bring some ivory on his beak. You could highlight that. Here. Oh, yeah, he's getting handsome. I think our um, eye could use some of that pink, that sizzling pink. Okay, that pops that up a little bit. Woohoo, I think we're about there. Now, I did notice that after I put the red on the border and after I put the red on um, the chicken and stuff like that, this down here has disappeared and become flat. So we're going to use, go on a theme here, and use that sizzling pink color. You know, you can follow the directions, and you can use exactly the same color paint. And that's perfectly wonderful. But a lot of times, we don't have the same color paint. And so it's good, I think, for us to play when we're doing a class like this, and learn how we can adjust and adapt our materials, um, so that we don't have to have the same exact thing. What if you have some of this sizzling pink, but you don't have the highlight I used for the red? You see, so, okay, now I think we got to get out some of that green and see how that works, too. Okay, this is the green. It's quite electric. It's very transparent. I think that's why these work. It's because they're not a solid. You can't base coat <clears throat> with them. You know, you're just going to put, it's like a little glaze. So, in the same area that we've got highlighted with our reds, Let's add some of that green 
see what it does. Let me get you closer in. Oh yeah, I like it. Okay, that just kind of warms things up just a little. I could spread some of that love around back here. Just kind of tickle it in real dry. Yeah, I like that. Now I'm going to pick up a little bit of the ivory with that green, which is going to make it opaque and give my leaf things just one more little pop. I think that probably did it. Alright, so that's where we're at. And I'm thinking I'm liking it. So now what I think we have to do is we have to finish it. We're going to do our checks around the border and our border. Um, get out my compass. Okay, measure, now, you know, this doesn't have to be a specific measurement. It really, 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 truly doesn't. Okay. If you like a wide check, I'm going to get that thing centered. Hello, come back. If you like a wide check, do it wide. The girls up in New York, um, they were so cool. We did um, the Halloween lace project. And instead of doing things um, exactly the way I did it, I had a little check around it. Some of the girls put in like an inch wide check, and it looked so sharp. So you never, never can tell. Let me find a brush. All right, let me share. I'm using a number 10 flat brush, and I'm going to flat, flat, flat into the paint. Let's get closer. Okay, when you're doing a check or something like that that needs to be even and smooth, Use a brush that's exactly the size as the check that you want to make. And you flat it into the paint. You do not scoop it out and with ridges everywhere. It's a flat, flat type thing. You'll reload probably every check or every other check. All right, I am awful. You guys that are anal and need to measure are gonna hate me, but that's okay. I can deal with the pressure. Um, I am really terrible about not measuring my checks, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure, I'm just going to mark that with my uh, brush, move over about the width of a brush, bring that one out, move over approximately. I dare you to measure this. Okay, I mean I dare you to catch me at it, you know, if it's really bad it'll look terrible, but an excuse, or not an excuse, but a, um, a tool that you can use to make checks is the compass. If you have to measure, let's make it easy on ourselves. Let's go here and we'll make a mark. Whoops, we can't pinch this one together. Okay, you make a mark and you make another mark and you set your metal down and you make marks putting the metal on the edge all the way around and then you can have it pre-measured and it'll do it. Now this is a little tougher because it is um, because of the pattern on there. Remember that causes us some grief. I prefer the estimating way. This works slick on floor cloths and things that need to have a little bit more accuracy because the size and things. So um, very cool tool for putting checks on when it does need to be measured. And so we will continue all the way around doing that technique. All right, so here we are. I've gotten all the way around my piece. And I'm getting here, and there's going to be one here. Pardon my dirty fingernails. I have been out in the strawberry patch. I'm going to have one here, then a space, and one here. It's going to be a little bit tricky here. So what you can do, A, you can do a little measuring. You don't want the last one to end up microscopically on top of that one. Okay, if I did one here, I'm going to do a skinny-ish one here, which means I'm not going to put my brush down all the way. And then I'm going to, so what I did is I put that right in the middle, and now I'm going to do skinny one to either side, split the difference, and now it doesn't look too, uh, you know, pre-unmeasured or whatever. Okay, here we go. Waha! Okay, I'm liking it. Okay, now that looks a little polka dotty, right? So, with all those checks and everything around there. What you'll do now is you'll get out a nice liner or a round brush whichever way you want to go. Then your black paint. Let's get that up here. Then your black paint with a little bit of stuffs here. This 
juicy, kind of thinnish, like um, mm, really, really heavy, heavy, heavy cream. Not real thin and soupy. Okay, we'll go back in. Zoom, zoom, zoom. All the way in as far as we can on the edge. Now what we're going to do, get over here with a dry, is now this time we're not going to take. What we're going to do is, I've got that line right there, I'm going to jump, oh, can you see me? I'm going to jump from, good grief, I'm going to jump from spot to spot just on top of that line. Now the neat thing about this is that anybody can draw a straight line for a half an inch. Okay, so this is a cheater way to draw a line. Okay, if you make a mistake, get out your Q-tip, spit on it, wipe it off, oops, don't wipe your other paint around, and do it again. Just go step by step. This is what we call taking baby steps. You do want to be to the inside of the line. You don't want to do above the line, okay? Make it arch just a little bit, like you're going straight around. Okay, and just work your way around. All right, we're getting ready for the final step, well, besides varnishing. And um, I'm using burnt umber with that yellow and a little bit of the antique maroon. Um, Delta's product that is a, de a burnt umber is a little bit redder, orangier or something. And so I'm just trying to warm this up just a little bit. You could just use, you know, straight burnt umber if you wanted to. So I just mixed a little of each in there. Now I'm going to use a blue shop towel. And I've got Deco Arts Antiquing and Staining Medium on there. I'm going to fold it into fours. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is just pick up a little of the staining medium, mix it in with my color. And I'm going to go over here on the edge and do a test. Oops, can you see my test? Okay, you can't barely see it. Okay, so we we'll use a little bit more. Mix it up just a little bit better. Okay, and wipe that onto my piece. Nice and even. What that's going to do is it's going to brown up your um, your piece. It's going to get it, warm it up in tone. Okay, so I'm going to use a little less medium and a little more paint. I want it to warm it up even more. Okay, and that just tones down. See how glaring white this is and see how much warmer that is. So first we get this all on there nice and even. I'm just kind of rub it to smooth it out. You don't want to let it dry without smoothing it out. You do definitely want it to be smooth before you move on to your new area. The antiquing medium will remove antiquing medium, which means you have to be careful about moving back and forth through your piece. Um, you don't want to be rubbing it off while you're putting it on. Okay. Hit that with the blow dryer after you have it all smooth. Okay, and then we'll get, we get to go again. Alright, I'm still not happy with the orange tone. I wanted a little bit oranger. So I switched to the color Mocha. Oops! I'm going to switch to a big oval glaze brush. I'm going to load it in the medium antique medium. I'm going to pick up my mocha with the glaze medium, brush off some of it. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, see, I wanted that kind of golden glow. Okay, so now that I did that, I'm going to put my brush aside. I'm going to pick up my paper towel. I'm going to fold it over to another side and do the same technique with the paper towel using the mocha color just to warm that up on that kind of a, yeah, that's much better. So, you know, don't be afraid to adapt when you're trying to match colors. Yeah, this 
warming it up a lot more. It's so pink colored. Okay. All right, now don't wipe it on your black area. You wipe that back off. Get a little crazy here. Okay. We had a spring anomaly here. We had 90 degree weather all this week. And we haven't got the air conditioners put back into the building yet. And so I am sitting here sweating. Not happy. I don't like to be warm. Not really warm. Okay, so we get that kind of evenly toned down. Pick up my brush with the medium, which I need more of. And I'm going to side load. I'm going to load. I'm going to load into my paint. I'm going to side load into the mocha color. And then I'm going to go all the way along this edge without really blending it. And I'm not going to wait a long time. I'm not going to play in there a lot. Because you wipe it off. Okay, so can you see it? Yeah, I'm going to have to dry. Okay, you got to dry. Like I said, this medium will take off this medium. So you got to dry it in between. Okay, so this is our 12 rooster clock. Um, we're going to coat this with one coat, or a couple coats, I guess, um, of matte varnish. And then you put your hands on and you hang it on your wall and enjoy. Um, I was going to show, I'm sorry to the gal that I said I was, um, I was going to show how to finish a piece using varnish and stuff like that. But this piece is the most minimal that you would ever need to do. It's going to hang on the wall. Um, the least minimal would be canvas. Um, it's going to hang on the wall and it's not going to get touched very much, so it needs just a coat of matte. And we use matte on this instead of satin because it's an old world kind of look, and so you do not want to have shine on something that's old. You want it to be matte so that it looks like, you know, it's been hanging around forever. <clears throat> anyway, I hope that you enjoyed our first four weeks of Toll TV. And these episodes will stay up so that you can um, start your project if you wanted to wait to see. Um, you know, how we go through the whole process. They'll be archived. There'll be an archived um, um, for this month's um, issues of Tool TV. What I would